Hey, thanks for stopping by my channel. I have decided to put together a bug bounty crash course for you. I've had quite a few requests to put together a bug bounty course that doesn't have as much of the ethical hacking, networking, and system enumeration privilege escalation within it because some of you apparently are just interested in web applications and what it takes to become a bug bounty hunter. So my hope is at the end of this video, you will be able to go out and find some bugs right away. Now this course is not an advanced course. It is taking you from somebody who knows pretty much nothing to someone who is able to go out and start finding bugs on their own. They're not going to be complicated bugs or really difficult bugs, but they are on the OWASP top 10 so they are very common vulnerabilities that you'll be able to find. One of the main differences between web application bug bounty testing and the other ethical hacking videos is the bug bounties focus mostly on just web applications and they're not focused on getting remote code execution. They are more just what can I do with this web application that I'm not supposed to be able to do? Is there some information I'm able to access that I shouldn't be able to access? So there is a bit of a difference between bug bounty hunting and say penetration testing as a whole. This is something that you would need to know as a penetration tester you will be doing web application testing and so what I have included here is also included in my complete ethical hacking course because you will need to know this in order to be a penetration tester though a lot of what we cover is not necessarily required in order to pass the certifications to become a penetration tester but it is still information that you're going to need to know. Lastly due to the major overlap between ethical hacking and bug bounties. A lot of what is included in this course is already been published on my channel. So if you follow my channel regularly, you can feel free to just skip this video because 95% of it is already up on my channel. One of the sections that is not is the XML injection or the XXE portion of this course. So you can go and skip to that and watch just that if you would like. Otherwise, I want to give you a warning. A lot of this is going to be a re-upload of what I have already covered into one course. And the reason I did this again is because I had a lot of requests to compile all of these resources into one video and to put them in order. So those who are new to the channel weren't clicking around trying to figure out what they needed to watch just for a bug bounty. So I thank you for your patience and enjoy the course. Before you dive into the course, please do like and subscribe if you are interested in getting new relevant content within the world of cybersecurity. Now let's jump into the course. All right, it did not take long for us to come to a crossroads where you get to decide what kind of virtual hosting software you would like to use. There is a free software called VirtualBox. You can download it here, you can download it for a Mac, you can download it for Windows. And I strongly recommend you avoid VirtualBox. I tried using VirtualBox when I first started and this was quite a while ago, so maybe it is better now. But when I ran VirtualBox, I struggled for months because I did not want to pay any money to have a good virtual machine hosting software. But after it kept on lagging and freezing and I couldn't get Hack the Box to work, I decided I was done with VirtualBox and I was ready to pay money. If you want to avoid paying money and you want to try VirtualBox and maybe you'll have better luck than I did, you can go ahead and download it here and we'll walk through the steps to do that. Or you can run VMware. If you are running on Windows, you will download it here and I'll have this linked in the course resources. You will download the VMware workstation and you will run this as your virtual machine hosting software. VMware is my go-to. I still use VMware. You get 30 days free. So if you're struggling with VirtualBox, you can try VMware for free for 30 days and you can run your Kali Linux machine on VMware and give it a test. I have never had any problems with VMware and it has worked really well for me. So it is the one I recommend. So you can download it for Windows or you can download it for Mac. I am running a Mac and I run VMware Fusion because that's VMware's software for Macs. And so this is your decision. You can 
choose which one you would like and begin installing it in the next video. All right, if you have chosen VirtualBox as your virtual machine hosting software, may the force be with you and you have much better luck than I did. If you are on Windows, you will go ahead and download for the Windows. If you are on Mac, you will download for a Mac. I have already downloaded VirtualBox. It is really simple. You click download. You will extract the download and then this is what you will be brought to a virtual box manager I have a really old machine that's actually deleted off my Mac now you can see the last time I ran virtual box was in 2020 and I downloaded this virtual machine from Kali Linux and so what you'll do is this will be listed in the course resources However, you will come over here, you will go virtual machines. It will ask you, do you want to use VirtualBox or VMware? And you will choose VirtualBox for the sake of this video. It is quite a large download. I am not going to download it because I am running out of space on my Mac. But you will hit download. It will save to your downloads if you're on a Mac. I'm assuming it will save to your downloads if you're on a Windows as well. And then once it is finished downloading, you will open up your file that it is in. You will extract it because I think it downloads as a zip. And once you have done that and you are ready to open it, you will right click on the virtual box image that has finished downloading you will right click on it and it'll say open with and you will click open with virtual box and it will bring you to this page it might actually even try to open the machine and start it and you can let it run and then shut it down you'll want to shut it down because there's a few things you need to set up on it before you do within this settings tab Okay, one thing I forgot to mention, when you launch your box or it automatically starts, you will need to click I copied it when you are prompted. It's going to ask you where the machine came from. I forget the other option. All I remember is you need to click I copied it. And if you save this machine on like an external hard drive or something and your computer, you, either your Windows software or your Mac, whatever you're running, crashes, you can always grab your old virtual machine off that external hard drive and when you put it back onto VirtualBox it's going to ask you the same thing and it will ask you where the image came from and you will select I copied it. So remember to select that. Also, you can instead of right clicking and opening it, you can come in here and name your Linux box that you've just downloaded from Kali Linux. You can go to the place where your VirtualBox is stored and you can click on it and then you can open it. I don't recommend that way because it is more challenging and I remember struggling to get that to even work. It's easier just to open with, let the box start to open, either let it open all the way up and your default credentials to log in is Kali is your username and Kali will be your password. However, shut it down once that's happened because it will begin to lag. If you don't, you'll need to come into your settings and this will matter based on how much RAM space you have and how many CPUs. We will go over to our settings. We will want to adjust our RAM to as much as you can dedicate. I think I do somewhere around 8 to 10. I am really not sure how much I give it. I know that it's a lot, especially on VirtualBox. It's going to eat all the RAM you give it, it will also eat all your CPUs. I typically dedicate four to the machine. I think the one that I I work on the most, I might even dedicate eight. I might even have more than that, I'm not really sure. But the more CPUs you can dedicate, especially to VirtualBox, the better, because it will use all of what you give it. And if you don't have a lot, that's okay. You just might not be able to run Hashcat, which we will get to way later in this course. I think it'll be somewhere around eight hours into this course. You might struggle running Hashcat, but that's okay. Uh, you will be able to copy everything as I have ran it for us in the videos. And that is it for setting it up. You'll hit OK. I'm going to close out of it, and then you will launch the box. You can right click on it, and then you can go to Start, and you will start the machine. You will log in, and I will see you on the inside. All right. If you have chosen VMware, this video and setup is for you. If you have chosen VMware, I think you have chosen 
wisely. So what you will do, I am running VMware Fusion, so I would come down here and I would download the VMware Fusion player. I have already downloaded it, so I am not going to do that again. Once it downloads, it will save into your downloads and you will extract the zip if it is in a zip folder and then you will open you will drag it on a Mac, you'll drag it into your applications and then you can launch your VMware Fusion software. If you are on Windows, I actually have a Windows box over here which I have not downloaded VMware Fusion on or VMware on, but I'm assuming it is going to be done just the same. You would come into VMware, you would come down to Windows, you will download it, you will extract it if it downloads into a zip, and you will then launch that and you will have something that looks similar to this. And it'll look, here you go, it'll look like this, basically exactly what I have here. And then from here we are going to put our virtual machine into our virtual hosting software. So we will go to Kali Linux. This is also linked in the course resources. We need a virtual machine. So we shall select that. If you chose VMware, you will download right here. It's 2.3 gig. I am fairly certain this is zipped and you will need to unzip it. There's a several different ways to unzip it and you will have to go about unzipping it however you choose. Once it is unzipped you can actually go into the downloads where it is saved and you can just click on that unzipped image and you can just drag it over here and you can drop it or you can right click and then select open with VMware Fusion. One thing to remember, when you open it, it's going to say, where did this image come from? And you're going to say, I copied it. It's important to click, I copied it, or you will not be able to get the image to open. Now that we have the image on our box, we will want to adjust our settings. You can right click and go to settings. We will want to have our memory really high. I went ahead and just put as much RAM as I could dedicate towards it and I have five processors, uh, five cores dedicated to the machine as well. You will want to dedicate as much as you can spare. If you don't have a lot, that's okay. You won't be able to run Hashcat as we will see later on. I have tried to run Hashcat with less cores and less RAM and it will just air out and say that there is not enough space or memory dedicated to the machine and that's fine if you don't have that. I will be able to show you all of the cracked passwords and hashes as we go through this course. But the more you have to dedicate to your machine, you will be able to faster crack password passwords and hashes. But this will not be something that we encounter until at least eight hours into the course. So you will likely forget about this and you can just run it with however much space you have to dedicate. And with that, your default credentials, when you launch your box, you'll right click and you can resume or it'll say start if it's in a powered off state. And your default credentials will be the username Kali and the password Kali. And with that, I will see you on the inside. Okay, welcome to this section on note taking. This is going to be really short, but also really important. One of the things you will need to do as a cybersecurity professional is be able to take really good notes. I like to use OneNote. There are other people who like to use flowcharts. I have tried the flowchart thing. It doesn't really work for me, but hey, Jason Haddix likes flowcharts and he is at the top of the game. So you can try out some kind of flowchart management system or OneNote, but you will need to have some kind of note-taking system. Otherwise, you will just continue to check the same things over and over by accident because you can't remember what you've checked on a web app or what checklist you have ran through. So note-taking is something you will need to do and be really good at. So consider note-taking and thinking through what is the best method for you and maybe even do some researching and find the style of note-taking that works best for you. And I think we'll go ahead and just stop it there with the note taking and dive into our first informational section. We're going to be installing a few tools here and it won't take very long. 
but the first thing I want you to install is gedit and I already have installed it just like this so if I hit enter it will pop open this little text pad for me here and I can write information and create files I like to use it instead of nano or V or vim because it's just a lot easier to move around I can actually use my mouse to click around inside of the text file so the way to install this is type in sudo apt install just like this gedit you will hit enter enter your password and it will install Install for you and then the second thing I want you to install is sublister so if we type in sublister like this not like that like this you can see that it doesn't do anything for me but if I type in sudo apt install and I hit enter type in your password it will go ahead and install sublister for me and now if I type in sublister like this it will turn blue and now be ready for me to use and we will install fuff i don't think fuff oh it is already on the cali box so we don't need to install any other tools those are the only two we need to install and we'll go ahead and start looking at how to use the most common tools for the world of bug bounty hunting one of the most popular tools for finding subdomains and the way you use it is just type in sublister just like this and then you will type in the domain you want to pull down subdomains for so we'll type in www we need actually a dash d in here so we type in dash d and i think we can actually just type in yahoo.com and hit enter and it will automatically go out and start searching for subdomains for us one of the important things to know is that when it pulls down subdomains for us not all of them are going to be in scope and you should definitely check to make sure they're in scope and some of them may not even be owned by your target so in this case we're looking at yahoo and some of these might not even be owned by yahoo so one of the things i like to do is if i was to open up this url right here and at the bottom i like to look to make sure that it says it is owned by yahoo and so this is sublister this is a great way to pull down subdomains there are other tools and other ways to use this but this is one of the most common and from here we can actually brute force other endpoints with fuff and we'll go ahead and check that out so with fuff this is one of my favorites is because when it brute forces it goes so quickly i actually like to slow it down or if i do run fuff i always use a vpn just just in case my ip gets banned i can just change my vpn to another ip address and continue on but i usually do slow down fuff so that way the server doesn't think i'm trying to dos it so when you use fuff it would look something like this we can type in fuff dash help and look at the usage we're shown right here you have to have a word list and then there's some other flags in here and the URL. So what we would do is use fuff-w and then we can go, I think we can type in user, share, word list, what are my options, derb, slash, small.txt. We'll use this word list and then we would type in https www.yahoo.com and then we'd type in fuzz like this. If we hit enter, we need to have our dash u right here. And if we hit enter, it'll automatically start brute forcing for us right here where we put fuzz to see if there are any extensions that we can find. A few things to note. We use the dash p right here for the delays. And you can also use the filter options right here in order to filter out. Let's say we wanted to filter out by a response code or we wanted to match a response code we could get rid of these 302s right here or anything that has one line or let's say one word and we can just filter out with fuff that way so that way the output doesn't go quite so quickly so we can just come up here and we could say fl so we're going to filter out we need a flag dash fl and where we could filter out by the line right here and we can say anything with one line don't return it to us and now you can see it running and what is brought back has more than one line on it and there's other ways to filter these out and you can go ahead and play around with fuff it is one of my favorites the other one i like to use is derb because it's really simple you just would type in derb and then you would type in the url that you want to 
attack and then you just hit enter and it'll automatically start testing for you. So those are my two favorites. I like to use Derb if I just need to do something quick and simple. If I'm looking for speed, I will use Thuff. All right, there is something called Google Dorks or Google Dorking, and I'm not really sure why it's called this. So if you know, you can leave a comment and let me know why it's called Google Dorking because that just seems like a really weird name to me. Maybe I could Google it and find out. But the thing about Google is pretty much everything on the internet is stored inside of Google, the search engine. You just have to know how to look for it. Google is constantly crawling the internet and storing new files, new URLs, and more information into their database. You just have to know how to find it. So let's say I was looking for a doctor named Charles Hodge. What I could type in is just Charles and then type in Hodge. We'll go with Charles Charles Hodge right here. This is what I was going to use and we hit enter. This was Princeton Theological Seminary's president, but this is not the let's say MD that we're looking for. What you can do is just add quotations and put in MD and now everything that comes back will be medical doctors or you can put in literally anything you want into the, these quotations and it will find it. So an example of this is if we say we want hacker one, it'll pull up hacker one. And let's say we want the hacker one programs. If we type this in, it'll pull it up for us anyway. But what we could do is add in the quotes just like this and say the programs and hit enter. And now everything that comes back will have to have programs inside of the search. And so this is one of the ways to use the Google dorks. You can also do this with GitHub as well. When you are searching through the GitHub code, you can type in the a specific word. Like let's say we're looking for hacker one and then we type in quotes and we want to look for an API. It'll pull down what has an API and then you can come in here and you can look to see if they have an API that you can use. So using quotes within Google will help you narrow down your search and what is brought back. And as I mentioned, this is something that you should do within GitHub as well when you're searching for, let's say, API keys or passwords or something of that nature. And now we're going to move on to burp. OK, in this video, we are going to be setting up our proxy burp. And right now, if we just hit enter on Google, it loads just fine for us. But when we set up our proxy, we will this is going to not work and I'm going to show you how to set it up. So we will come over to these three lines. We'll go down to settings, scroll all the way to the bottom, click settings, go manual proxy configuration. We're going to go 127.0.0.1 because this is the default with port 8080 on burp. So if we say okay to this and we come over to Google now and we try and run it, it's going to tell us the proxy server is refusing connection and we will need to open up burp. And if this is the first time you've opened burp, there might be quite a few things you have to click through in order to actually get it to open. But once you get it to open, it will look something like this. So if we come to proxy and options, you will see right here, this is what we have set up and we're gonna need to import these certificates. So you'll click this top one next and we're going to go next. We're going to open up file. I guess we're going to select. We're gonna have to, and in the file that we select, we'll go to our desktop. This is a great place to store it. So we'll name the file cert.ca and we can save this. It will save to our desktop. We'll say great. And now that this has saved, we're going to need to add this into our security. I've already added it in, so I'm not going to add it in again, but it'll look just the same. You'll scroll down once you've gone three lines to settings. We'll just show this again, settings, privacy and security scroll down that was too far scroll down to certificates i guess it's all the way at the bottom you will click view certificates and then you're going to import and we're going to go to our desktop and we're going to say we want all files and then we're going to save the cert that we just opened you will click open and i have already installed it so we'll say okay okay and now when we come back over here to google we'll need to turn our proxy interceptor off 
we can test it to make sure it works and it does. I accidentally clicked one of the little tabs down here. So if we say Google, we are now running as we need to and if we need, we can intercept a request just like that but we're not gonna get into that just yet. So that is how you set up Burp and we will continue on. Okay, we are going to be starting our URL portion of this course, just what exactly we can learn from the URL, what we can do uh, in the URL, which is actually quite a bit. The URL is actually something that you can learn about how the website functions you can look sometimes you can see information personal information sensitive data can be stored there so for example if in this url it had an id of my name or my email address those are things that you wouldn't necessarily want in a url or specifically if a password was in there those are things that you could actually uh, report um, if you had sensitive data in there um, but we're basically going to be looking at how we can manipulate the URL to our advantage and what we can do specifically with pages. So I remember when I first started down this path of wanting to learn web app pen testing, sometimes you'll go to a capture the flag website and it will be just a blank page. And I remember coming to the blank pages and thinking, oh my goodness, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. But for you, we've already gone through the recon portion of this course, and you know to go to Derb and just start looking for directories. And then also, we're going to be looking at the source code. I mentioned it briefly um, earlier, but it's something that can be really helpful, and I'll show you why. So I made this very, very basic HTML website. What I'm about to show you is something that Derb would probably find, but if it doesn't, um, you can kind of see how this is going to work. You can come in here and you can just go page one and then you can go, okay, well, if there's a page one, is there a page two? And then you hit enter. Oh, page two is blank. And then you go page three and then you hit enter and we hit a forbidden page. And so if we have this forbidden page, there's something on it that we're not supposed to be able to access. Well, how can we get there? And this is when um, remembering looking at source code can be really helpful. And so we can come over here and we can go view page source. And you can look through and see just how basic this really is. And you can see that we have something hidden and you can go, there is this directory or this file for more information. And so you can come here and you can copy this and you could paste it in up here. Another way to come across this is you can see that this is hidden. We're going to cover this in more detail um, as we go through the course. But as you go to this, the source page, one other thing that's really helpful to look through is to right click and just go inspect. You can inspect what is on the page. It's so basically the same thing that we saw was the source, but you can see where this is hidden. Sometimes you will have login pages and there will be hidden fields that you can open up and try and manipulate. And you can just actually type this into text and it'll actually show up on the page as plain text. And so we have this file here. If you remember, we had page three was forbidden. And we're not able to enter into it. Um, but we can try. This HTML actually won't be on any websites. I just didn't take the time to uh, remove it. And so we'll ignore it and act like it isn't there. Um, but if we remember from this right here, we have this edit three, which I'm guessing is our page three. And then this would be this is the forbidden page where you can access files. Now, we're actually going to go and practice something very similar to this. And when you do this, what you're going to need to do is go to Google. I would encourage making a new Gmail account and then going and signing up on Hacker One. And then we're going to be using Hacker 101 to practice um, what we just saw for us to be able to gain some practice. It is a CTF. 
Okay, we are going to set up our Hacker One account. You can actually come into Google and type in Hacker 101. This is going to be their capture the flag practice area. And you can actually click this. And what will happen for you, it actually, I've already logged in. But what will happen for you is it's going to say, it'll bring you to a login page. Once you reach the login page, you will have to go and create your own account with Hacker One. And once you create your account with Hacker One, you can navigate back to Google, type in Hacker 101, and then click on the Hacker CTF, and then it will bring you back to login. You will click the blue button, and then you will log in, and it will bring you to this page. And if it doesn't bring you to this page, page you have a navigation bar very similar to this one and you will just click on CTF and then you will be at this page but you're gonna have to register in order to reach this page and then what I want you to do as we begin working with actual vulnerable websites is go ahead and click go this is going to be the very first challenge I have for you once it loads you're going to be brought to this page and the way Hacker One has set up their training program is that you will have flags and then it'll have a bunch of random numbers. And once you reach that flag, you will know you have found the area of the website that you were not supposed to find or is supposed to be vulnerable. And so with that, I want to have you pause this video and see if what you've learned in the last lesson, you can figure out how to find the flag all on your own. So with that, pause the video and give that challenge a go. Okay, if you got it, that is great. Um, if not, I'm going to go ahead and reveal to you how to find this specific flag. Before you do, I would challenge you to go back and watch the previous video and just see the steps that I walk through and then go ahead and come back here and give it a try because I am certain with what we have covered, you can find this flag on your own. So the way we find this very first flag is by coming in here and just right clicking and then going to view page source. And then we can look at the page source and we can see what is in here. And it has a background image and then here it is, background.png just a little bit ago actually came in here um, to try this and I my guess was this is going to be a file that we were not supposed to be able to access and so copied this came over and pasted at the end of our URL we're gonna paste it and then hit enter and then here is our flag um, we're going to move on into the next video um, and I'm going to help you get set up on what you're looking for and then I'm going to turn you loose and see if you can find the next flag on your own. Okay we are ready for challenge number two. We are going to come into the first easy program we can enter. We are going to only find one of these four flags. We'll actually come back later. We're going to go ahead and click go and pull open this uh, vulnerable website. And I'm going to turn you loose once this loads because everything that we have done so far that we've covered should give you everything you need to know to find the flag that we're looking for in this specific capture the flag. And so with that, I want you to go ahead and click around in the website and see if you can find the flag. And so we can go ahead and pause the video now and see if you can solve the first challenge. Um, I believe we've covered most everything you need to know to find this flag. And so the first thing um, that we would do is just start clicking around and you could maybe make a page and see what happens. We've got a page here. We're on page nine. And so we can go back, we can edit this page and we can see we can edit our page nine. We can go back, we can click on the markdown test and click the button that doesn't really do anything. We can come in and view the page source. And we can look around, there's not really a whole lot here for us. 
And so we can go back and we can go to home, we can go to testing, and just um, as we continue to click around, a couple of things that stand out to me in our URL is that we have this page. So we can come into, let's just go into the page that we created. Um, we can come in here and just go page one, page two, page three, uh, not found. Well, we know there has to be at least nine because we have created page nine. So we'll go to four, five, and then we hit the forbidden page. If you remember in the example that I showed earlier, we have seen a forbidden page before, and then we'll keep going. We'll go all the way up to page nine and look at every single one, every single option we have because we know that's how far we are as we've created. So we have all of these, and then page nine should be the one we created. So what page was that that was forbidden? It was page five. So how do we access this? We can go view page source. It says we don't have permission, and it is forbidden. Well, there is another way to view this page. And if you remember from the example website that uh, I made and showed earlier, uh, you would know that we can try and get around this because we have the option to edit this page. And so if we edit this page and we know we can edit the page that we made, maybe we can edit the page that was forbidden. So we can come in here and put in five and there it is. There's the flag. So I hope you found this. I think by now we've covered everything needed to find a, a flag like this in the URL. I have a few more challenges for us to go ahead and try. Um, they're going to be on a website called Over the Wire, and I will actually help you navigate to that page and get logged in. We don't actually have to make a user or create a user, which is very nice, and so it's very easy to access and to practice on. And so with that, I'll see you in the next video and we'll get that all set up. Okay, we are ready for a few more challenges. And so we're going to go ahead and head over to a website called Over the Wire and you can click on it or type it in. Um, and we're going to go ahead and click on uh, Nodis. This is where we're going to be working out of. We can click on that and it will pull it open. And this is where we're going to get started. I'm going to go ahead and open a new tab to keep this one open. So we're going to start on level zero. Password is going to be level zero. And so all we have to do is copy this URL and paste it in and then hit enter. And our password is going to be notice zero and notice zero and then we'll hit enter. And every time you find a new flag, you will come up here and you will change the zero to a one, the one to a two, the two to a three, and it will prompt you and say username. And you, so we have not a zero right now, the next username will be not as one. And then the flag that you find will actually be your password for the next level. We have gone over everything needed to find this first flag. And I want you to go ahead and try and do that now. Okay, hopefully that went well for you and you were able to find the first flag. But before we get into that and get going too far, there's one thing I forgot to mention in the uh, recon portion of the course. Something that we will use in Nodis and you will use later on in your bug bounty hunting career is the robots.txt file. So you can have, the way we get to that is you just hit a forward slash and then you hit robot.txt and then you hit enter and it will take you to a page. This one doesn't have one set up, but it'll take you to a page that doesn't allow search engines to find. And so sometimes websites will have files that they are hosting online that they don't want Google displaying. And so they'll have a disallow or allow for Google and Bing and Yahoo and other search engines to go through and crawl their website and it will go through that robots.txt file and will say do not 
allow Google or Bing or Yahoo to crawl through these files. And so it's always a good thing to check the robots.txt and roll through and see what's allowed and what's disallowed and then visit those disallowed files and see what's in there or those domains or directories that we find. And so with that, we'll go ahead and solve this challenge. And so I hope by now you know one of the first things we do is to go ahead and view the page source or you can inspect the element, uh, either one works. I like to view the page source because it gives us a more complete view. And so one thing I want to mention about the Nautis levels is everything inside this head tag, which will be from here to here, doesn't have anything to do with the level. And so sometimes you'll see the password for the previous level up here, which the next one um, would be right here. This is our password for this challenge. And so I hope you found this. And next time, if you view the page source, this password will be right here. And just so you know, it's inside the head tag. And so it's not actually anything that's going to be relevant to us. And so here's the password for the next level. So you can go ahead and copy this. And the way we get to the next level, if you remember, is come up here, go to Nodis, change this to one. It will prompt us for the username, which is going to be Nodis1 and then our password, which we just found in that flag, and we hit enter, and that takes us to the next level. And if you want to go ahead and try and solve this challenge, um, you can do that now. I'm going to stop this video, and we will solve this challenge in the next lesson. And so this one says that we are not allowed to right click. It's been blocked. However, for me, if I go ahead and I use my keyboard to right click, if I hold down control and hit the right click it, or click, then it works for me. And so my right click is available through using control. And then I do the exact same thing. I go to view page source. And then once in here, you can look through our code and then they've got it commented out the password for not as two is, and then here's our password. Now this may seem really easy, but you will actually find people who have put in these comments in the code of a username or a password or an API key, and has they just have forgotten to delete it. So they'll put them in here while they're developing the site or while they're writing their code and they need to remember their username, their password, other sensitive information, and you will actually come across it just being hard coded right onto the site. And so that's why we check the code. And sometimes you will find like a, like you will really find something just like this, a username, and a password. These seem very easy, but they're also very practical and they're something you will come across pretty regularly. All right, this is an update. Since I originally made this video and was saying that developers will accidentally push usernames and passwords, I was working on the back end of a web app and I accidentally pushed my database username and password to the public github page so when i say this happens i mean it i have done it i'm sure almost every single developer at some point has pushed something sensitive to github and it is something to watch out for so there is my update and so i want to i guess i shouldn't say pretty regularly you will come across them most people will have already reported these this is why it's important to be one of the first ones on a site to pick a specific target and make sure you keep up to up to date what's coming out new on different domains and different subdomains as you continue to work through different programs and your bug bounty hunting so we'll go ahead and copy this password we'll come back to our main site we'll type in notice 2 and we will type in notice 2 and paste our password um, I'm going to not save this. And then here we are again. It says there's nothing on this page that should give us a clue. Everything we need to know to solve this challenge, we have already covered previously. I think there's a little more to it that will cause us to need our critical thinking skills, but we have covered everything needed to solve this challenge. And so I'm going to go ahead and give this a go and we'll go over the solution okay how did that go hopefully you were able to solve this challenge 
I'm actually going to show us a couple different ways that uh, we could solve this challenge uh, just so that we have a more rounded understanding of how the URL works and how um, different files and different directories are included into domains. And so with that, I think by now you probably know what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and right click. We're going to view the page source and we see here's where it says there is nothing on this page. And so we can look through everything in the header doesn't matter, isn't relevant to us. And so all that's left is this image and then we have a link. And so what we can do is we can go ahead and copy this and we're going to paste it into our URL. And so as we paste this, we can go ahead and hit enter and see where it takes us. And when I first solved this, I went and I checked to see if I could inspect the element to see if there was anything else on this page other than this picture, or maybe there was something inside of it that would help us. And when I was looking here um, at the URL, I noticed that this is a file or an image and it's inside of a directory called files. Now, if you remember, we can actually go back directories and you can actually just delete the pixel.png and it will take you to the previous directory and here it is. Or we can go back and just Another way to see this is you can do just like we, like we learned in our home folder or in our Kali Linux uh, terminal, you can put have your slash and you can go dot dot slash and you can hit enter and that will take us back one file or one directory. And so we've already viewed the pixel and now we've been in the parent directory, um, but now we can see this users.txt. And so we can click this and it'll take us into a new file and here's usernames and passwords. And so you have Alice, Bob, Charlie, and then here's Nodis3. So this would be our username. And here is our password for the next challenge. And so we've seen all of this before. Um, we have seen that we can find in our source code things that don't show up or hidden files or hidden images. And so we've seen this before. So I hope that you would have copied this and have pasted it. And we've also seen what's called the directory traversal going back or deleting and moving into different files and different directories. And so I hope that you were able to solve this challenge. And so we'll go ahead and get set up for the next challenge. Do it different ways to install a Wasp Juice Shop and you can watch the next five minutes of the video and see which one you think looks easier. I personally think the Try Hack Me OWASP Juice Shop right here is the easiest way, but I'll show you how to download and install OWASP Juice Shop onto your local machine, and you can decide which way looks easiest for you and you would like to run. So I'm gonna show both of those to you now. Since I originally have made these videos, OWASP Juice Shop has now been put on TryHackMe and it's really simple to just go to TryHackMe, make an account with them and connect with their servers and then open up a Juice Shop box. So you can either install it the way that I have already shown in the previous video or you can come to TryHackMe. It is free to make an account and open up OWASP Juice Shop and from there everything will be the same. You will just click start machine and it will open up a machine like this and then once this gives you an IP address you can copy it to your clipboard and open up a new tab and paste in the IP address and it will open up Juice Shop for you. Now I'll let this load and I'm going to cut this and then I'll show you how to open it up and everything will look just the same. The way you're going to connect to the box is come up to access machine. You're going to click open VPN, download right here and it will download your VPN for you. You'll come over here, you will CD into your downloads, and then you will type in sudo openvpn and then whatever your VPN download name is, and you'll hit enter, enter in your password, and it will connect you. I'll go ahead and do this now. Okay, I have connected to the VPN, and now we can copy this, and with our new tab, paste this in, and we will be brought to the Juice Shop web app, and we will accept the cookies, num num, and then we are ready to 
start. So it's up to you which way you would like to install Juice Shop. Okay, we are going to go ahead and install a vulnerable web app on our local machine. Uh, it's a great place to practice. It's put out by OWASP, um, which is going to be a great resource for you. Rather than just seeing me show you how to do something or listen to me tell you about it, um, this is going to be a place that we actually go out and practice and so we're going to download it by going to sourceforge.net and i'm going to have this linked for you in the resources and you can go ahead and click on that link and hopefully i can get it to link direct directly to the download so that you don't have to navigate through any of this and this is actually my second time trying to download it because the first time i downloaded uh, the wrong version and i don't want that to happen to you and so hopefully that link will work for you. But if not, you can follow along and I'll show you how to get to the proper download. So we type in juice and we click on juice shop. It was the second one in the search engine. We'll go ahead and click files. We want 9.1.3, which is right here. We're going to be installing node 12. And so we need to make sure that we get node 12 and it's on Linux which is way down here at the bottom. This is where I went wrong the last time. So we have Juice Shop, Node 12 with Linux. This isn't the right file. That's not the file we want. This one right here is the one we want. We want the TGZ. And so we'll go ahead and click that. And after you click this, it might take a little bit for the download to go ahead and take place, but you can go ahead and click it. Your download will short begin shortly. And then once it downloads, we'll go ahead and save it and it will automatically save to our downloads. And so I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video and I'll resume it once the download has popped up. Okay, there's our download. We're gonna go ahead and click save file and this is going to save it to our downloads. We can go ahead and click okay. I'm gonna go ahead and close out of SourceForge because we no longer need that. And then we're gonna navigate over to our terminal I am in the home directory, so I'm gonna go ahead and CD into our downloads. I will LS, and then here's the file we just downloaded. We need to unzip it. So we're gonna go ahead and type in tar, and then we will go dash XVZF, and then juice shop. Yours isn't going to pop up like mine is because I already typed this in once. And then I'll tab to autocomplete, and this will go ahead and extract all of the, the content for us. And then once this is finished, you will need to install Node.js and then NPM. So we'll go ahead and type in sudo apt get install. And first you'll go Node.js. I already installed it, so I'm not going to install it again, but you'd hit enter and it'll say, are you sure you want to? You will put in Y and then you will hit enter and it will go ahead and finish the download for you. It might take up to a minute because there's a lot of files, especially in NPM. And so we'll go ahead and second, you'll do sudo apt get install NPM. You will hit enter. You will enter your password for the first one. You won't have to enter it for the second one. And that will go ahead and run and install NPM. And then we're going to LS in our downloads and we're going to change directories into juice shop. And so we'll CD into our juice shop folder. And every time you run OWASP juice shop and you want to open it up and you want to practice in this vulnerable web app, you will have to CD into your downloads and CD into juice shop because when you spin up your server, it is going to spin up whatever content is inside the directory that you're inside of. And so now to start NPM, we just type NPM start, and that will go ahead and spin up our server for us. And it now says our server is listening on port 3000. And then we can come back to our search engine and you can type, this is what we'll be typing in, just localhost um, 3000. And you'll type that into your browser. And this is now our vulnerable web app that we're going to be practicing on in the future lessons. Um, but before we get to practicing and seeing what we can manipulate and what vulnerabilities we can find, uh, I want to walk us through a little bit of what we're going to be looking for and how to identify um, different vulnerabilities and how we're going to use Burp to help us find them. But you will notice that if you have Burp running and you turn your proxy on and you start clicking on things, 
and you refresh the page, burp is not intercepting anything. It is not working for us. So we need to configure our traffic so that it goes through our proxy. And we're going to do that by going over here, opening a new tab. We will type in about config and hit enter. And I will warn you to proceed with caution because this um, will change how your browser functions. So you want to accept the risk and continue. And we are going to type in network dot proxy and this one right here allow hijacking local host we'll click this and we need it to change to true and then we can go ahead and close out of this tab and now if we refresh our page you can see that our traffic is running through burp and we are able to intercept the requests okay in the next few videos we're going to be going through a couple of different powerpoint uh, the reason for this is i think it's really helpful for us to have some kind of foundation before we begin looking at examples i think by the time we get through the powerpoint you're going to be a little confused and probably still not know what exactly we're looking for or what's going on but my hope is that with the powerpoints and then just a couple of examples you'll be able to start finding some of these bugs on your own and we're going to be practicing on hacker 101 as well as juice shop which we just downloaded and we're going to be looking um, at how to use a burp before we begin looking at trying to um, exploit some of these vulnerabilities i think that you will be using burp a lot and so it'll be helpful to go through and kind of look at how it works and explore just a couple of its functionalities before we begin our exploitation of some of these vulnerabilities. And so we're going to be looking at iDoors, business logic errors, and we are also going to be looking at manipulating user input and cookies and tokens as well as we continue in this course. And so we're going to begin by looking at insecure direct object reference. These are called iDoors that really doesn't tell us a whole lot, but they're really simple to understand once we get going. These iDoors are going to be um, just parameters that we can change that we can so that we can bypass specific functions on a web app with iDoors or business logic errors you can bypass payment options you can reverse payment options so that you're the one getting paid you can put things into other people's carts uh, there's a lot of different ways you can use iDoors and when you're out hunting on your own uh, you're gonna have to be creative because there are many different ways that you can exploit iDoors you can skip login pages you can access someone else's account I personally one of the first bugs I ever found was being able to write on someone else's social media platforms. It was actually just one platform. Um, and there was just one specific area of the web app where I was able to change an ID and write on someone else's wall of their new newsfeed. And so that is an example of an IDOR. You can also leave feedback on someone else under someone else's name. You can edit another person's blog or their post and so these are just examples of iDoors and different ways that you are going to be able to find them and iDoors are probably iDoors and business logic errors are going to be the most common bugs out there which is a great thing because it makes it um, easier for us to find them and they are easy to find as well and so these are something I think we should learn very well and we are going to have a significant amount of time to practice these because there's actually a lot of different areas and ways to practice these, especially in Juice Shop, which we just downloaded. Uh, the best way to test for these, and I think the only way, is by creating two different accounts. It is always good to create two different accounts because you will have to test in real life against your own accounts you cannot test on someone else's account. So you can't write actually on someone else's wall. This would be out of scope or you can't leave 
feedback as a different user. These will always be out of scope. You don't want to ever mess with the functionality of the application or the people who use it. You will only use your own accounts to test against and it also makes it easier to use your own account because you already have a second ID number that you can use on your attacker account. So you'll have an attacker account and a victim account that you will use and so you don't want to test on someone else's account. An example or a simple example to remember is to look for hidden uh, inputs. You'll actually see this as well in Burp um, when you create an account. Uh, it won't say input type hidden but you will see such as a name and your username and it will say are you an admin and then it'll say value no. An easy way to show one of these errors is just to change this value to yes or true and you will automatically have admin privileges and we're actually going to be able to test this out in juice shop something just like this so you'll get to see this in action and so we're always looking for parameters and things that we can change to get us somewhere that we should not be one of the other places that you will find iDoors is in cookies a lot of times cookies and tokens will host user information so that's how websites will keep you authenticated not all of them but some of them will be through cookies and so you will have inside cookies maybe you'll see something in your cookie like user ID and then a number and you can change the number to something else to see if you can access that account um, for example if you had two accounts you'd take the user ID of your victim account and you would replace it on your attacker account and see if you can access parts of that application that you shouldn't under another user if you were getting malicious with this you would change the value to zero or one and see if you could gain admin privileges to the web app and another way to test for this is to see if you can log in save your cookies first or your tokens and then log out and then see if you can log in and delete your previous cookies or tokens and then repaste in your new ones and see if they have been terminated or ended if they haven't this would be a um, logic error because when the session has ended so should the cookies or tokens and so you can see what to manipulate and where you can manipulate different things um, within cookies and tokens as well these aren't specifically iDoors but they're similar they're similar enough that I think they can be included together and so when we're testing we're going to be using burp this is going to be where we're at the most sometimes you will be able to see these in a URL for example if we have this example here www.website.com and let's say you have an invoice you just purchased something and it says your invoice number is 12 in a URL you can just change this 12 to an 11 and see if you can access another customer's invoice and if you could this would be a sensitive information disclosure it's something you shouldn't be able to access and that would be a simple IDOR um, I think they're easier to test for in burp because it's all laid out for us as we'll see in the coming videos and so also another example would be you can upload images or resumes um, like on indeed you can upload a resume and you can see in the URL if you pull your resume so let's pretend this is indeed and it says www.indeed.com and then it's got a slash and it says resume equals 87 and that's your resume you could change this and see if you could access someone else's image or resume just like you would have with the invoice and see what you can access but remember out in the wild we are testing our own accounts and so I actually have an example here for us I pulled off of hacker one of an iDoor that somebody actually has found and so we'll walk through exactly how he pulled this off and so you went to he goes to the website remember creating two accounts he has a victim logs in as the victim he creates a blog on the site he saves it and then what he ends up doing is going into the victim account or the attacker account and he does the same thing makes the blog and then from there he clicks the save button and then goes to the edit user profile and saves it opens up burp and then what happens is he can change the, the ID with the victim's ID 
and this is this would be a clear eye door accessing something that you shouldn't be able to and we've seen things similar to this with the URLs earlier in changing URLs and then he forwards the request to go to the victim's account and the website information and you can see that it has changed and so this is an example of an eye door I think we'll be able to make this sound a whole lot easier once we're actually walking through them and so I want to go and talk a little bit more about cookies and the URL and what exactly we can do with them then we're going to look at how to use burp to find eye doors and then I want to turn you loose and let you try and find an eye door on your own in this video we're going to talk a little more about URLs and what we can do with them cookies and tokens and then we're going to look at something called cyber chef and then we'll move into burp and exactly how it is going to help us in its functionality but before we get there I was talking with my wife and I just said hey I think I'm gonna have to warn that uh, my PowerPoints are going to be full of errors because I actually made them just for bullet points for myself and I was going to keep them on my second monitor and then I realized I didn't have anything to show you and I wasn't just going to have a blank screen. Um, so if you're wondering how can somebody with a PhD have such poor quality PowerPoints, they were originally just my notes and so I decided rather than sit here and comb through them and go back over it, I will just show you this is basically what my notes look like when I take notes and uh, walk you through walk you through them just so we can have a better understanding of a few more exploits before we move into burp so first um, changing passwords uh, you will actually come across this in juice shop when we are practicing and more as we get further into the course sometimes you will see a url that looks similar to this or in burp it will pop up at the bottom of a post request and we will have something similar to this like a change password you will have the username and then the new password will be stored right here and in something like this um, you could actually grab someone else's username and on your victim account try and change the password to it and see if uh, you're able to pull that off or you can go ahead and see if you can maybe delete your victim account by instead of having change password you'd have delete account or delete user or just delete and then you can put the username here and you would obviously not have the password you will also in burp be able to have delete instead of uh, you'll have put post delete options and you can try and delete the account through burp and if you are unable to even if you aren't able to pull any of that off if you have a URL that has a username and a password in it even if it is encoded with something as simple as base 64 this would be an information disclosure and we'll get to why this would be an inf information disclosure in just a few slides uh, we talked about this a little bit in the last the last PowerPoint in the last video if you have a website something similar to this which I actually just copied this out of the OWASP guide and the OWASP pen testing guide as well as another image that we're going to come to here in a second sometimes you'll come to something like this if you are logged out and you copy and paste in a URL that requires you to be authenticated and it says authenticated no and it does not allow you to view the site you can just change this authentication here to yes or true and see if you are able to access the uh, site and see what you can gain access to and then we can check the logout functionality and this is why it is an informa information disclosure if you have a username and a password in the URL because it is possible for you to log out on your computer and then close the browser and you'll be able to open up the browser and it has a cache the previous page that you were in and you can go back into the history and open that page and if it opens even if you're not able to go to any other links because you're not authenticated anymore but if it opens that URL and your username and password is in there it would be an information disclosure or if you log out and you don't close the browser it's possible to hit the back arrow or the back button and go to the previous page and have the information there and this can also be more than just information disclosure if you're able to hit the back button after you've logged out and then browse the site again 
and it re-authenticate you. This is something that's listed in the OWASP guide. It's uh, something that happens. It's not very common, but it's something to check for. And you might be thinking this isn't a very big deal because that's what I originally thought I was. Okay, we are going to, in this video, go through some of the functionality of Burp. And so I'm gonna go ahead and have you navigate over to Hacker 101 and get into their CTF. And we're going to open up Postbook and you can go ahead and click go and pull it open. And when you're there, the first page you'll come to will look like this. And so we'll go ahead and come over on Burp. You can turn your intercept on and make sure that you are sending all of your traffic through your proxy by coming over here We'll go to preferences, scroll down to settings, and make sure that you have manual proxy configuration. And then it looks like this. And once you have that done, you can click OK. And your proxy should now be set up to intercept your traffic. And just to give it a test, you can refresh the page and make sure that it pulls through here and you can forward all of the requests we intercept or you can just turn it back off and then turn it back on. But we are going to come in here and we are going to sign up. And so we'll go ahead and click sign up and you can just see what's going on in here. We have our, our sign up.php. You can see it's pulling that from our URL. We have a get request. We'll forward that and we'll come back over here. And this is where you're going to make your username. And we can just type in test and password can be test and you can submit your query and then in here you can see your username and your password uh, and if you wanted to actually try and mess with this and see what we can do with it we would send it to repeater so you just right click and click send to repeater and over here we can send this request as many times as we would like to and so in here we can go we can change the username and click test one and then send it and we are getting a 302 in response so let's go ahead and shut this off and see we have successfully signed up and i think we actually created the test one account as well yep so we have made the test account and the test one account and while you're in repeater over here you can see that this would be uh, not a very secure way of submitting these things you will actually come across this pretty regularly um, even on large very common websites and you can see what what you can do here you can try and manipulate things and see just what you can do and maybe type a get request and change to a different url and see what response you get over here there's lots of things you can do and in repeater you can send this as many times as you want to the server and really just try and figure out if you can get anywhere that you shouldn't be with this and so we're going to go ahead and come back to our proxy turn it on now we are going to just create a post we'll go hello world create post we have a user id of five and remember every time we see id we should be thinking idor what can we change where can we go what can we get with this? And we have the body of the message over here. We have a cookie over here. You could bring this over to CyberChef and see if maybe there's anything in there. Uh, if you remember, we just go magic and then we would paste it in and you can see we didn't get anything out of our cookie. And so that's okay. We would come back here. We can send this to, it says we get a redirect. You can follow the redirect and then come down here and see what your response is and it says we need to sign in so you have to be authenticated so the cookie is um, necessary something that we have to have in order to continue on for authentication purposes but as you can see this is kind of how i would just go about testing at the beginning just see what i can do with this id what i can do with burp with body see where i can get where i can go see what responses come back and with that i think i've given you a pretty good clue here with this user ID. Uh, there is an IDOR in Postbook. I'm going to give you the challenge now to open up Burp, come in, make an account or two accounts, and see 
if you can find the eye door. Before we go ahead and solve this challenge, I want to introduce you into one more functionality inside Burp that is going to be helpful in the future as you are doing bug bounty hunt hunting, and that is the intruder. We're still right here in intruder. Now, one of the things we could do with intruder is as we come in here and we just refresh this page, we have this ID of six. Let's say there are thousand different numbers in here. What you can do is send this to intruder and it will actually go through these numbers for us. So you can come over here and you can go to position and we will clear this and you'll highlight this number six. And what it does is it will go through every number we specify in here and replace that number six and then give us back the response. So we can come over to our payload and we can go simple, we can do a simple list and then we will put in just numbers, we'll do one through ten, so you just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And now we have just a simple list and we have just the one position and we're going to go ahead and run through these numbers. And so what you do is you click start attack and go OK and it will automatically replace that for us. And then we can click on these and see what we have in the response. And you can come through and see if we have found anything in here. It says write a new post, my profile. It doesn't look like anything private. This is for my own eyes only. Number two, and we have we see the same thing. And this one actually has someone put in actual content. And then you can go down to number three, and you can see how this would make it easier. So you don't actually have to go through and do one, two, three, four manually. You can, but you don't have to. And so what we would do if we wanted to get more malicious with this, as we're looking for an eye door, we can come back into our proxy here and you can turn it off or you can use burp. Um, I'm going to use the URL uh, just because it's what we're used to, um, but I would encourage you to actually try this with burp. I'm going to show you how I would do it with the URL and then you can actually come in here and see if you can run this exploit and find the flag with burp and without using the URL. And so what we do is the exact same thing. You can come in here and you can just go one and then somebody posted this. It's not private, it's to the public, and you can come here and you can type in two, and this actually has the checkbox. Yes, this is my own eyes only, and so this would be something that is not supposed to be seen by everyone, and so this would be considered an eye door. If this was an actual program, you could report this as an eye door, and not only that, you can write inside someone else's entry here, and then you can save the post. And in saving the post, um, I am not actually sure why there are two flags, maybe one for writing on someone else's wall and one for the eye door. I'm actually not entirely sure, um, but you can see the author was also an admin. So we made it uh, beyond just a regular user and into an admin. And so this is how eye doors work. We're going to be moving from postbook into juice shop and the way I want to work through the juice shop vulnerabilities is by giving you just little hints um, maybe telling you where what part of the application there is a vulnerability and then setting you free and after you have spent a significant amount of time and you're starting to get frustrated or you want a clue just continue watching the video and I'm going to work through the, some of these vulnerabilities step by step but I want you to give it a shot and try and figure out where the vulnerability is and see if you can solve the challenges on your own. And only if you're really struggling, come back and get another clue and then pause the video again and see if you can figure out the rest of the challenge on your own, kind of like we have been doing. But from this point on, it's going to be a lot more difficult for me to show you very specific vulnerabilities on multiple websites because at this point, Juice Shop is going to be our main place of working because there's not a whole lot of options when it comes to practicing specific vulnerabilities and then me showing them to you. So I wanna give you clues of where they might be located in the application and then set you free to try and exploit them. 
and then only when necessary help you with another clue. And so with that you can actually continue playing around in Postbook and see just what else you can do in finding eye doors. Okay, we are ready to find our first eye door on our vulnerable web application. So you can come in here and try and find it on your own or I can give you a tip on how to get started. If you want to try it completely on your own, you can go ahead and pause the video now browse the application, intercept your traffic with burp and see if you can find the iDoor. Your first tip is going to be, we'll find the iDoor in leaving customer feedback under someone else's user. So you can go ahead and try and find that now if you want or keep playing the video for the next tip. Okay, the next tip is going to be creating an account. You will, I already created one. I figured you didn't want to sit through me creating an account, so you can actually just come up here, click on the account setting, the account tab, go to login, create a login, and once you're logged in, try and find how you can leave feedback as someone else we are going to go ahead and solve this challenge if at any time you feel like we have gone far enough and you have enough clues you can pause the video and try and solve it on your own from that point forward but we're going to come over here to this menu we are going to click customer feedback now I want to give you another helpful tip if math is not your strong suit you can actually open up and inspect the element you can come to network and then you can refresh this and in our network we will get a whole bunch of get requests and we will look through and find the one since this is called captcha we're going to find the one that is labeled with captcha and in there it will have for us the answer and you see this request we're going to look at the scoreboard at the end of this video and I'll kind of talk through what this is but we're going to go to this um, as soon as we solve this eye door. but as we continue scrolling through and we're looking for the capture right here you can go to the response our answer is going to be 11 so it will solve for you whatever math problem you have and that's the easiest way to get through these and so our answer is going to be 11 it has our user name we can leave a comment I like to just leave hello world we will give it a rating and then make sure to intercept when you submit this and so we'll hit submit and now we have our user ID if you want, you can go ahead and pause the video and see if you can figure out what to do from here. What we will do is we're going to send this to the repeater. We can come up here, open it up. We can send this request to make sure it goes through. It says it was created, so we have successfully left feedback. But we want to leave feedback as someone else. And so what we do is we can change our ID to let's just go 14 just pick an arbitrary number that's less than the one we were using or the one we were assigned and then we can send it and it says it was created so now we should be able to turn off our proxy intercept come back to our web application and it tells us we successfully solved the challenge of forging feedback so this is an example of an iDoor where we are leaving feedback under some other user's name and now I want to go to the scoreboard real quick this is where you can see the challenges and uh, you can see all of the challenges that are available on this web application all right um, I was playing around with the comment section in the products and I realized you can actually leave feedback as someone else 
other than coming over here to our customer feedback. You can actually lead feedback from a different user right here on these products. And maybe you actually figured that out in the last one. And if you did, that's awesome. And if not, you can go ahead and try and solve this challenge on your own. And then we will go through it together. So if you want to give that a shot, you can go ahead and do that now. Okay, we are going to just open up one of the items that already has a review so that we have a name that we can leave feedback under. And what we'll do is come over and turn on our intercept and type in some kind of message. And then we will submit. We'll come over here and see if we can find it. And here it is. We can send this to our repeater. You can come over here and send this and it says it was created. So we have the message and then we have the author. So instead of having our name in here, we can put in bender at juice shop. Uh, was it dash? I think that is how it was written. And then we should be able to send this and we'll actually just put in something else here and send it and it says it was created we'll turn the intercept off and you can see here it was it was created under someone else's name and it actually says we have successfully completed the challenge again okay our next challenge is going to be one that we have talked about uh, but we have not actually seen and I have not come across any vulnerable web apps to actually test this on and show it to you, but we have talked about it. And you might have to use some of your Googling skills or just if you get stuck, follow along with the video um, and get a hint before you move on. But we are going to create an admin account. And this is something that is very possible that you will come across. It's not very common, but it does happen that you can find ways to create an admin account or escalate your privileges. So we're gonna go ahead and make sure our intercept is off. And what I need you to do is go ahead and create an account and see if you can figure out how to get the account enrolled as an admin. And so you can go ahead and try that now. I think what I will have to do is log out and I'm going to make a new account just the same and I will come in here and go not yet a customer uh, this time we'll go John at John dot com and as soon as you get this done we will turn on our intercept and we will register the account. Now what we're gonna do here is we're going to send this to repeater and over here is where we'll work on escalating the privileges to an admin. So we'll send this and just to get a response to see what we have here. So our role is a customer and this tells us that we're going to need to change the role and so I actually just did this a few hours ago I was just working through the application and I'm going to show you exactly what happened to me because this will give you a really good idea of just the trial and error that we go through when we're testing applications so I came in here I typed in role just like this and I typed in admin and if you send it since this uh, user has already been created over here. We're actually going to have to change this to one. And if we send it, we can see we've now created another user, but the role is still customer. And so I changed this to administrator and it still didn't work. So I tried to change this to user admin 
and then change this over here again and we are still a customer and I've tried user I tried admin I tried administrator and finally what happened was I deleted this and I came up here and I tried to just move our input to see if that would make a difference and I typed in admin just the same as before and that looks good and we'll change this to a three and then we will send it and now you can see our role is now admin so we have created a, an, an admin user so if you take this user with this password that you just made you can log in and browse the juice shop application as an admin and so you'll actually see things like this in the wild they're uncommon um, you can actually go on hacker one and read the activity and see where people have actually got this to work and you can see um, just read the articles and read the submissions to observe how people have pulled this off some of them are going to be more complicated this than this but some of them really will be this simple okay what i um, need you guys to do for this next lesson is go ahead and open up a new tab and up here we're going to go to port port swigger and you can go ahead and search for it it should be the first one and we're going to open it up and we're going to move over to the login button i've already created an account and so go ahead click on login create an account we're going to need it especially in the coming lesson so go ahead click the login button make an account and i'll see you once you're logged in okay once you have reached your login page go ahead and click on academy and then go to all labs and once this loads we're going to go ahead and scroll down until you find business logic and i believe it's pretty far down in all of these labs and so scroll down to our business logic errors vulnerabilities right here um, and we're going to be working through these right here and so let's continue going forward so these actually say solve because i already made the videos for these and i realized that i never actually explained uh, how you guys should get here and get to these labs before i started filming these videos so I'm going to edit the video and these are going to turn into unsolved. Okay, we are going to look at a few business logic vulnerabilities. And so these are very similar to the iDoors that we have been looking at. And so we're going to go ahead and just start here with this one right at the top. So you can go ahead and click on it and we can look and see what exactly they have for us. And it says that it doesn't validate user input and we're to buy this lightweight jacket you can go ahead and open up the lab and this is where it brings us it said we needed to log in so we will go ahead and do that and it gave us the login credentials so we'll log in and now we are supposed to buy this jacket so I guess we can go ahead and view the details and add it to the cart Let's actually uh, come in here, turn the intercept on. We'll add it to the cart and it tells us our price right here. I don't know exactly how much we're allowed to spend, but uh, I think we should be able to, let's see if we can make this a negative number. And we'll go ahead and forward that and then we'll just turn that off. And it did not add it to our cart. We have a hundred dollars to spend on this jacket and this jacket is way over a hundred dollars thirteen hundred dollars so we'll go ahead and see if we can um, turn the intercept on add this to cart and let's just uh, change our price here 
and see if that works. Okay, we were allowed to add it to our cart. So we have no need to apply a coupon and we should be able to place our order. And it says we have solved the challenge. So things like uh, this and business logic errors, IDORs and business logic errors, they're, go they're going to be things that you have the opportunity to find. These are pretty common that you'll find these business logic vulnerabilities. They happen when developers get lazy or they're just not really paying attention to what they're doing. Uh, I've actually seen really advanced developers make very simple mistakes that made their web applications vulnerable just because they weren't paying attention. And so you can find these. They're pretty common. I know there is at least one bug bounty hunter that this is all they do. They look through Burp, they look for business logic errors and what they can change just to find stuff that they shouldn't be able to. And uh, vulnerabilities, these are pretty simple and they do take a long time to find, but you can find them just by doing really simple things, by just changing numbers and inputs. Um, sometimes you will find stuff that has been encoded. It'll say like you'd have the lightweight jacket. Let's actually go back. I'll just show you. Sometimes we will add things to our cart like this and you would have this, it'd say price and it would look like this instead. Um, we'll encode it, base64. You'd have this sitting inside your price instead of that number. And so what you have to do, if you see something like this, you'd have to take this and you'd come to your decoder or you can go to CyberChef and you can put it in and try and decode the price. Rarely going to see it where it's just a plain number, but this is way more common that you would just see uh, a number here and that you would have to decode it. Sometimes these prices will be stored in places other than just something plain and simple like this. And so it's something that you're going to have to look for and poke around. They do take a while to find, but you can find them right off as a beginner who knows very little. And we're going to look at one more and then I want to send you off on a challenge and see if you can find a business logic error on your own. Okay, we are going to continue with the business logic vulnerabilities. We're going to go ahead and open up the second one. And after this one, I'm going to set you loose on a challenge. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and open this up. It looks like the same as the one before. We need to buy this jacket and we have our login user right here. So we'll go ahead and log in and we'll try and I'll proceed with buying the jacket. Okay, here's our jacket. So we'll go ahead and view details. We'll add it to the cart. We're going to do the exact same thing we did in the last one, and I'm going to do it the exact same way um, by starting out. Oh, we don't have a price. Um, so we got our product ID, our product, and here's our value. Let's get two of them. And I'm assuming we have the same amount of money in our, in our cart as we had the last time to spend. So we'll go ahead and just put the negative sign in front of the two and we'll see if it allows us to put in a negative number. And we were. So in our cart, if we go look at it, it says we have negative $2,600. That means they are going to pay us. Let's see if it'll go down by using these buttons. It does. So you wouldn't even have had to have done this in Burp. You could have just come over here and click this button. And it means they're going to pay us this amount of money. So when we place our order, we're definitely going to be able to buy our jacket and our store credit is going to increase. Our price is not allowed to be less than zero. At least they have that in uh, in place. So we'll go ahead and okay, made our cart empty. We're going to have to go back and put that back in our cart. So what I think we'll do is We'll add this to our cart as well. I'm not sure how many of these we're going to have to add. We'll go ahead and add one in so that way we can buy our jacket because that is our challenge. We'll go ahead and make sure that's negative. Forward, turn that off. And now we should have two negative items in our cart. It has to be above zero, but less than 100. So what we can do is we can just continue to subtract these. Oh, we'll add these. 
we'll go ahead and add these until we hit our price. Okay, it went back to zero and removed it from our cart. So we'll go back over here, go back over here. Let's find something a little more expensive so we don't have to add that so many times. We'll go with the pool. Come to burp, turn our intercept on, and this is exactly how this would happen um, if you were testing it. It's just gonna be a lot of trial and error. We're going to need, I'm gonna guess, at least 15 to 15 of these. We'll just go ahead and add them to the cart. We don't need to intercept that. And go back to our cart. And there our total is now $76. So what we did is we just added 15 of these pools, which got us close to $1,500. And then we, or yeah, $1,500. And then what we did is we went ahead and added our jacket in at a negative price because it wouldn't let us purchase anything at a negative number and we only have a hundred dollars to spend and so this should solve the challenge this time so we'll go ahead and place our order so i just wanted to add that you saw me make a lot of mistakes and a lot of trial and error in this video and I want to thank you for being patient, but I also decided not to edit out uh, all of the clicking that I had to do and the failures from this video because I wanted you to see what it's realistically like as you test web applications and as you're on the hunt, you will be doing what I just did the majority of your time, just trying to see if things work and as they fail, you just go on and you try something new and you try a different way to try and exploit the application or the vulnerability. And so I wanna just encourage you that as you become frustrated or things aren't working to just keep pushing on and see if you can find that vulnerability. Okay, it is time for your challenge. So if you navigate over to Juice Shop and get it running, what I want you to do is try and solve the challenge to where you actually are being paid two or three or four hundred dollars or more from this application. We just worked through two labs that are similar to this. So you can go ahead and try and solve this challenge. And when it's done, you should get the green bar at the top of your screen that'll tell you that you have completed the challenge. So I want you to go ahead and pause this video and give that a try. Okay, how did that go? We're going to go ahead and walk through this in the same manner in which I would solve this. So go ahead and add something to your basket. And then we'll check our basket. And then at this point, what I would do is I'd go ahead and turn the intercept on and walk through the whole checkout process and see if there's anywhere that I am able to modify and see if I can modify um, this in any way, shape, or form. And uh, what I think I'm going to do is I don't actually want to walk through and have you watch me put all of that information in um, just to solve this challenge. So we'll go ahead and see if we can actually modify this before we get there. So it says we have basket, basket ID of five. We're buying product number four. Let's see if it will let us do what we did in the previous challenge and put in a negative amount. So try 99, turn the intercept off. It says we were able to add those to our to our basket and they're gonna pay us. Ah, that didn't work. Okay, they're gonna pay us if we do that. So we'll go ahead and we'll try that again. $100 wasn't enough. So we'll come back to our products. We'll add to our basket. I uh, forgot to turn burp on. We'll add this to our basket. We'll forward, forward. Here's our quantity. I wonder if the rest of our contents at the end of this string. Well, we have our quantity, so what we'll do is we'll type in negative, and we'll do 200 this time. And we'll forward that, and go to our basket, and that's more like it. 
we're gonna get paid $400. So what you do at this point. So for the next few minutes, I'm gonna show you a little bit of a walkthrough and explain SQL injection from the Nodis website. And I don't want you to actually go there or try and do this walkthrough. We're gonna have plenty of practice when I have you create account with Port Swigger and we walk through the Port Swigger SQL injection labs. And so for just the next few minutes, as we go through the Nodis example, I'm and then I'm going to show you what the code actually looks like in a MySQL database. And I actually wrote a React app that's hooked up to a Node.js backend with MySQL as the database so you can kind of see what the code looks like. Not that you need to memorize it, but it might help a little bit. Then we are going to move from there into a port swigger and try to walk through the SQL injections together. So for the next few minutes as I am on the Nodis website, just try and follow along and maybe catch a few nuggets of detail to understand. And then as I walk you through the actual back end of a SQL database, I hope that you can understand it and maybe even do a few of the port swigger walkthroughs with me and then come back and then watch the MySQL database explanation again and hopefully it will begin to click. This is one of those attacks that is really really common and so it's something that you should know and up front i'm just going to tell you it might take you watching this and going through these labs several times to fully grasp the sql injection but that's okay it takes time to become an ethical hacker so with that let's jump into it okay we are going to begin working through some sql injection uh, this is something that you can find there are bug bounty hunters that dedicate their time only to looking for SQL injection. So if this is something that you find interesting, you can become really proficient at it and this can be something that you primarily search for. So this is um, something I suggest learning and learning well. It's easy to look for. Uh, you don't really need to know a whole lot about SQL databases in order to find these, but it does help. In the bug bounty world, it's actually a lot easier than if you find these on a capture the flag because all you have to do is put in a time delay to prove, to have a proof of concept. But in a capture the flag, you'll have to know a little more than what we're going to go over here. But for the sake of not going through and learning how to program in SQL databases, uh, that would, I think it would take just too much time. And so we're going to go through uh, how to find these if you were to start looking on bug bounty programs. And I went ahead and opened up Nodis 15. Uh, you don't have to go through this or work through this. I'm only going through this to show you uh, what it's going to look like. And then we're going to actually go over to Port Swigger and we're going to work through their practice SQL injections. And so just to give you an idea of what we're doing, when you come to a login form, such as this one, one of the best things you should do and you should regularly check for is just to put in a single quote and then you would hit enter and see what happens. And it says this user does not exist. What we're looking for is an error in the query. So you, I would go and I would do a double quote next and I would hit check existence. And if you can hit an error, this is what we're looking for. And I'll actually show you in BERT because this is where you're probably going to be sending your request through. So you'll hit check existence. You would send this to your repeater. And I'm actually just gonna go ahead and change this so you can see it. And then you would hit send. And it says we get an error in query. What we're going to see here in a little bit is we're going to see this be a 501 and an internal service network error and that's usually what you'll see start finding these but you will find what is called a blind sql injection and we're going to look at those a little bit later so we still have the error so what do we do with the error is we're going to start the enumeration process but we're actually not going to do that here. I just wanted to show you kind of what we're looking for here so that you can look for it on your own in the first Port Swigger lab and see what you can find if you can find it on your own. But just to give you a little more of an idea of what's going on in the background, the SQL database and the SQL language is going to look something like this. Select all from users this will be where 
username equals, and this is what we input right here. So this would be our input. So what we did is we took this, this is what it'll look like, and this is what we can put in here. So you'd put your single quote or your double quote, and in the case of the Nautis web application, what it has is a something like this, and then here's where you're putting your query, where you're putting in to see if the username exists. And so when we put in another double quote, what happens is you break the query and this produces the error right here because it doesn't need to be there, it shouldn't be there in order for this to work in um, programming. And so that's how you break it. Okay, what we're about to go over is going to be a little advanced, but I think it will help you visualize what's going on beyond more than what I just showed you in the last video. So what I have up is actually MySQL Workbench. We have here just a simple database username I was testing. Here's an actual username and password. This is what a table will look like. And so in our query, we have select all from users, which is our schema, and then the table, which is users that's not capitalized letter here. And so this is what a table looks like. And what's gonna happen is this is running on a server. And when we send a query to the back end of a web application, it will reach out to the server and see if our query is true. So I wanna pause here because so this is an update. I want to pause here and explain something a little better that I noticed I didn't do a very good job of. When you make a query to a database, the whole reason I wanted to show you the workbench is so that you could see these are the tables. So if I came over here and I said from select all from blog post, then we're going to be grabbing the tables from inside the blog post. And so when we look at this, select all from users, this is showing all the databases. So this is a database, this is a database, and we're selecting from this database right here, the users table. So the first one that we see right here, this is the database, and this is the table within the database. So select all from database and then table. This will be really helpful in the future when we learn to run SQL map and we need to know the context of SQL map. And so this is what it will look like, the code will look like. We have our database and we're querying our database and we are selecting all from the users table where the username equals, and then you can just pretend this is blank because um, this is where our input is gonna go in here. So we're selecting all users from the table where our input is at and the password is equal to the other input and so this makes sure that we have an actual username and then it makes sure we have a password that matches our username and our password from our table and so what this looks like is over here we have have our login here and if we type something in and we type in a password and we hit login it's going to say wrong username slash password and so if we come in here and we actually have our actual login made, it'll say we are logged in. And so when we do a SQL injection, basically what we're doing is sending in a request that we decide what it's going to be to the database to the back end of the website that reaches out to our database server. So this is a pretty simple SQL injection that we're going to be covering here. And we're going to be going into union select statements after this video, which I think are more common than what we're about to go over. And so it's very important to learn the union select SQL injection statements. There are some bug bounty hunters that dedicate all of their time only to SQL injection. So I just made this, I'm shooting this video because I really want you to understand what's going on and it'll make more sense. Don't worry if it doesn't make sense right now. You may have to come back to this video more than once and go over the union select statements labs on your own and then come back to them after a day or two and just continue practicing them until you really have them down. And so one of the things that we're looking for when we do a SQL injection is I'm gonna inspect this so you can actually see this happen. We're gonna have our console up, ignore my errors because my code is not perfect. 
when you put in a single quote, it will break this right here and it will give it will crash our server. So if we go ahead and throw that in, you see our connection is refused. And if you come over here, you can see our application has crashed, which means I need to restart it. And now our application is running. And so when you send that, you'll have an internal server error, which is what we essentially just got right here. And so how we get past this is by actually giving it a statement that is true so that it will give us back the first character the first login in the database it'll give us back the first username and password and so we're going to make a true statement right now and so what we'll do is we'll just throw in it doesn't really matter and then our single quote and then we'll have or one equals one and then we comment out everything after that and then our password doesn't matter either and it says we're logged in but if we just have this right here it doesn't really it'll tell us that we're not logged in because this isn't correct so if we have this in here what we're saying is is this username right is this a true username and the answer is no you see we have wrong user a username and password but one equals one is always true and then we comment everything out after this statement with this hash so our password doesn't work. So you see how this is all in one line of code. This is all getting ran together. It's making this query all together. And what we're doing is essentially commenting out everything after our username so the password doesn't even matter. So when I say we comment something out, we're commenting out everything after our statement. And so we throw this hash in here and everything after it's commented out, the password doesn't matter. Uh, I think we can get by with no password because I don't have it set up right now that you have to have any characters in here and it will come back as true. And this is what, what I'm talking about when we say sequence statement and we're querying a database or a server. Okay, there is one other thing I really want to show us. We're going to go over this again, exactly what I'm showing you right now in another couple of videos but I think it'll be helpful to see it so one other thing is whenever you give it a database a true statement it's gonna come back with without an error or saying it's a logged in it's gonna come back as true so we just saw the statement that looked like this we had our username and then we had or one equals one and one equals one is always true and so it comes back as logged in or it comes back as true there are other things we can do to get get information from a database. See, we want these username and passwords and we have an ID. So we have three columns here that have information in them. Let's say we know the table is users and we wanna know how many columns we have. What we'll do uh, is to pull down something true. If we wanna pull down the number of columns because we don't actually know how many there are, and we want to just find out some information from this database you can actually come in here just like we did before put in our random username that doesn't really matter and then this is what i mean when i say a union select statement so we're going to connect union to our statement here so we have select all from users where username equals these things and then we're going to add to it we want to add a union select if i can spell we're gonna select null, and this will tell us, is there one column in our table? And we send this, we're gonna crash the server. I'll go ahead and send it so you can see. We crash the server, I have to come over here, restart the server, and then I'm just gonna give you, there's three columns, we know there are three columns. So we'll throw in null two more times, and this will say union select null, 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 which is gonna pull down how many columns there are. And if we send this, we have we didn't we got and crashed the server because we didn't comment out the rest of the string that we were querying so here we go we'll log in now we have no undefined came back which means we have no errors so we know there are three columns and so this is going to come up in one of our very first sql injections that we're going to be doing on the port swigger web application and their labs that they have set up for us to practice on and you feel free to continue practicing in there but this is something we're going to be doing and we're going to be going in a lot more detail 
and you'll have to pay attention to this comment because it will change between two dashes without the semicolon based on the type of database that we're using. So I do apologize if this seems confusing. Hopefully it becomes more clear. It's in the top 10 most common vulnerabilities. I think it's in the top five most common vulnerabilities. Looking a little difficult right now because you've never seen it before. But by the end of this module in the course, if it's still unclear, you can go back and try it again and go back through this module and it will become more clear and you will memorize how to find these vulnerabilities. So with that, I will see you in the next video. Okay, we are here on portswigger.net. Um, you can go ahead, I actually went ahead and logged in and created a new account. Uh, you can come in here and you can come up here, click sign in and then create a new account. And then once you've done that, come back to the website and you will go to academy you can go ahead and click that and it'll load up and then you'll go to all labs it will take us to some of the labs we're going to be working through and the sql injection if you are having a hard time finding this exact url right here i will put a link to it in the description or you can just type this out in order to get to all the labs um, there's a whole bunch of them. We're not going to be going through all of them because some of them get kind of repetitive. And uh, it has been a while since I have done these, at least a year. And so I actually thought what would be good, I'm not going to rehash any of these before we go through them. So you are going to see me make mistakes and you'll get to see my thought process and you'll kind of just get to see how I work through these. And so if you want, you can go ahead and open up the first one. And then I like to open it up in a second tab over here. And they'll t give you some instructions and kind of tell you uh, what you're looking for here. They'll actually tell you where to find some of the SQL injections so you don't have to spend your time clicking through the whole web application and trying to figure out where things are. And so they kind of point you in the right direction. And so we're looking for a SQL injection with the union attack. And so what this looks like, let's uh, open this back up. So this is what their side of the query looks like. And then we would be typing in, you would close, close it off. In our case, it's going to be a single quote, union select. And then we're going to be looking for the number of columns and what we can find within this vulnerability. So we come over here and it says, find the number of columns returned by the query. And uh, there's a couple of ways to do this. I think I'll show you both. I think they both work in this program and you can decide what works best for you. So you can come in here and I actually want to first uh, give you a chance. I'll show you kind of what we're looking for and see if you can find it on your own. So you can come in here, send one of these to your repeater and see if you can find the SQL injection without any help. And uh, it's okay if you haven't, we really haven't covered this a whole lot, but in the coming videos, um, we'll be able to do this multiple times over and over. And so you'll get the hang of what we're going through and what we're looking for. Okay, I'm going to send this to the repeater. I'm not actually sure where the SQL injection is even at. Um, I think it will try right here. Okay, that's what we're looking for. It is going to be um, right here. And so we're looking for this right here. This is what I was talking about in the last video, the internal server error. If you can produce this error, what you should immediately be thinking is there's going to be a SQL injection here somewhere. It is here somewhere. You just have to figure out how to exploit it. Challenge actually tells us to do is we're looking for the number of columns returned. And so we're trying to figure out how many columns are on the specific table. And so if you think of an Excel spreadsheet, you have rows and then you have columns. And what we're trying to do is figure out how many columns exist on 
the table. And when you're doing a SQL injection, we're going to be looking for passwords as we go through the Port Swigger program, but there are a lot of other things you can look for, and we're going to get to those and exactly how to find them. Even though you're never really going to pull down actual information on a bug bounty program, I wanted to walk through as someone who doesn't know how to program in SQL, what to do if you come across a capture the flag and you're trying to find specific things such as usernames or flags or passwords. And so um, we'll get to that in the coming videos. But now we have produced this internal server error. And so we know we are looking for the number of columns using the union attack. So we have our single quote, which breaks the query. And then we type in union. And because we are sending this request, we have to send a plus for the space. If you don't have the plus in there or and you actually put a space in, it will break what we're trying to send. So union, select, and then you put in here null, which is just nothing, and then you send it. And it comes back with nothing. And then you just hit comma, and then you would put in null, and you'd send it. And it still sends us an error. So we put in null again, and we send it. And oh, you know, what we forgot to do was you have to um, close out the rest of the query. So in here, we have to put a dash dash. So that comments out everything after our statement here. So and then we'd come over here and we'd put in null again. And it still says we haven't found the number of columns. And so it hit on the number three, it came back, okay, so this statement would be true. So when the statement is true, it'll send us back a response. And so we have our response, which means there are one, two, three columns inside this lab we're working on. And so as we come into the next one, we'll read the instructions and we'll work through it. What I would like for you to do is go ahead and open up the second lab and click access to the lab. And I want you to go in here and do exactly what we did last time and see if you can remember how to find the number of columns in a SQL table. So you can go ahead, you can open that up, see if you can find it. Uh, and then if you want to try and figure out how to find uh, the columns containing text, you can Google around and see if you can figure it out. If not, we're going to work through it now and you will have the opportunity to practice um, finding columns containing text as well as continuing to find the number of columns in a table in the future. So this isn't your only chance to try and practice this on your own. Okay, if you were able to uh, pull down the number of columns, uh, then you have figured out or learned what we went through in the last lesson. But if not, we're going to go ahead and work through this one again. So we'll come in here, click on one of these tabs, and we'll have a request sent, a get request, and then we will take it and send it to repeater, see if we can find a, an internal server error. Might not actually be in this one. Let's see. There it is, send this one. So we'll send this to repeater and Put in our single quote there is the error so this is where our injection is going to be and so if you weren't able to find it you can go ahead and from here and see if you can solve the challenge and pull down the number of columns in this lab so you can go ahead and give that a try now what we do here if you remember is we type in union and our plus and then we select and then we have our plus and then we type in our first null value for the column, and then we comment everything else out after the request is sent. And it says we still have an error, and so we try this in. You actually don't have to have these in all caps. It's just kind of common practice for 
what people usually do is have things in all caps. I'm not really even sure why. So if you know why, you can go ahead and let me know. So we found, we pulled this down and we found one, two, three columns. And so if you made it this far, good job. Congratulations. You have learned how to pull down the number of columns, but now we're supposed to pull down um, which column has text or which ones um, take text. And so you would put in your single quotes and then you put in a string and then send it. And that one came back as an error. So we'll try the next column. And it is the second column contains text. And we'll go ahead and try the final column as well. Whoops. Okay, so it would be the center column is the one we would go after to try and pull down information, which is not actually available in this lab, but it is going to be available in the coming labs. So in the next lab, I want you to try and go through this, find the category of where you're going to find your error, and then try and pull down union select, the number of columns, which column contains text, and then we'll work through how to actually pull down the information from that column. All right, I did not notice after I had closed the video that the lab still said it was unsolved. And for those of you that is bothered when a lab goes unsolved or you want to see them all solved, I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. So we'll go ahead and uh, I'll show you where to find that. Um, if you want, you can go ahead and try and find find it. Uh, I actually think this is a good challenge. I think you'll be able to find it. Just go ahead and go into perform the SQL injection, find the one that contains the a string, and then look through the response and read through it and see if you can find the answer to solve the challenge. This here solves the challenge for you. So now the challenge is solved and I will see you in the next lesson. Okay, we are back with the third SQL injection challenge. You can go ahead and click on it and read through the prompt. Um, I'm actually going to give you the challenge to see if you can pull down which column or columns contain characters and will accept a string and then I'm going to walk you through pulling down data from the table. And then I would suggest practicing. So after we go through it on this lab, to try and go through it again without the video before you move on to the next lesson so that you can continue practicing things as you see it happening. So we'll go ahead and enter into the lab and it's going to be pretty much the same. So uh, if you want to go ahead now, I'm going to wait a few seconds and you can pause the video and see if you can complete the challenge and pull down which column or columns contain a string before we go ahead and continue learning how to enumerate the table columns. So by now, this should be pretty familiar to you. We're going to come in here. We're going to look for our request that I apparently passed. We'll send this to repeater. We'll make sure that we get our internal server error and then we'll try our union select attack and send it and see how many columns we pull down. So there's only two in this lab. And so what we'll do now is uh, we're going to pull down uh, information from the table. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Then I'm going to give a an explanation of the best way if you don't know any SQL or you don't know how to write any SQL statements, um, how to find table names if you find this in a capture the flag and you don't want to go through the long process of trying to figure out the table names through writing SQL statements. But before we get there, I'm going to show you, this is what we'll, what we'll do. We have two columns. You'll see, check to see if they'll accept a string. 
and that one does. I'm going to go ahead and leave it. And that one does as well. That means there's two, both these columns have information within them. And let's say there was a third column. If we were to write our SQL statement, we would have to include all three columns because the query has to be considered true. You would just leave the, the null statement in here. And we're going to see some of these in the coming videos. And just to give you an idea that you can go ahead and try and do these. You do null plus username. See, this is what you have to do. You'd leave this as um, an empty column. But in our case, we don't have three columns. So we're going to just go with the ones that we do have and the ones that will accept a string. And so we're going to pull down usernames. And then we're also going to look for the passwords in the table. So we look for the password, and this should pull down for us the username and the password from the users table. And see, this looks like a user, this looks like a password, this looks like a user, this looks like a password, and this would be the administrator, this would be his password. So in our response, we have pulled down the usernames and the passwords that are within the table. And this would give us access if we wanted to. You could log in as these people if this was a real website. You would have access to their accounts. You can go ahead and turn your proxy off so that the web page loads. And then you will have the usernames here and the passwords. And you can come over to log in and you can give them a try and see if you're able to log in and see if this solves the challenge. There, that one solved the challenge for us. So with that, I want you to go ahead and see if you can figure out the next challenge without any help, see how far you can get and if you can make it through. We are going to skip over this fourth lesson and we're going to jump into the fifth lesson. And you can go ahead and open this up and read through it. This time we're going to be in an Oracle database. And so we're going to be trying to pull down the version that it is running and so with this tip we can see there's a built-in table called dual so they actually give us the table name this time for us to run through and i think with what you've learned so far in the sql injection cheat sheet you should be able to figure out how to solve this challenge so if you want to go ahead and pause the video now and try you can go ahead and do that if not we're going to walk through the solution together. So we'll open up the page. We'll go ahead and turn our proxy on. And this should all be familiar to you by now. So we're sending that to repeater. We make sure that we get our inter internal server error. And then we move on just like we have before. So we type in union, select, and then we'll check for a single column. But if you remember the table name we were told is called dual. And so we can send that and we still have an error. So let's try for a second column and we see that there are two tables or two columns and the table name of dual. So we'll come in here and make sure they receive, they can receive a string and they can. So what we'll do now is we're looking for, if you remember, the version name. We're trying to pull down the version name inside the response. So we'll come back to burp. And since these can receive 
string we type in here banner and then if you remember from the previous lesson if we have multiple uh, columns that can receive a string and we're not actually going to use one we have to leave it with null so that way that column receives an input we just don't want anything from it yet at this point and then for Oracle the way you pull down a version is V dollar sign and then just the word version And we'll see if that sends it for us. I saw this change in the background to solved. So that gets us our information that we need. And so we should be able to scroll through here and we find it right, right in here. Okay, in this lesson, we're going to go ahead and open up this one, the MySQL and Microsoft. I will just go ahead and tell you they are trying to pull a quick one on us because instead of using the typical dash dash right here that we use in Microsoft to close out or to cancel or to comment out everything after your query you use you will use a hashtag and that will stump me I will come across that and I can sometimes not figure out what's going on and I can spend a significant amount of time trying to figure it out and in the end I was using the wrong comment and so uh, it's one thing to be aware of and in this lab we're going to inject an attack we're going to pull down the type of type and version of MySQL that's being used and so this is very very similar to the last one and when you go ahead and open up the lab we are looking to make the database retrieve the string. So I'm actually not entirely sure how to get this to say solved. So we're gonna be figuring this out together for I guess the first time. So I'm guessing what we're supposed to do is use our union select attack, pull down the response that we get right here and try and find the version, which will look something like this, that it's using and then go back and put it into a string and it should give us the solved problem solved up here so if you would like to go ahead and give this a try on your own you can go ahead and do that and I'll give you a few seconds and you can pause the video and then we'll walk through it together we're going to continue the same way we have been turn on the proxy pick a category, send it to repeater, turn the proxy off. I'm going to lower this so when it comes through as solved we can see it. We'll see if we get our error and we do. Try it for null and then don't forget the way we comment out is with the hash or the pound symbol. It has more than one column and it has two columns so what we will do is we will make sure they can both receive a string and they do and so the way we pull down the version in Microsoft MySQL is a little different than the way we did it with the Oracle one we'll go with the two at symbols you type in version and if you looked through the cheat sheet you would know this is how you pull down the version for Microsoft and so what we do is we type in null because you have to have both columns filled and then we'll send it we came back with a positive response and so we'll look and see if we can oh it solved it for us it already said solved i thought we were going to have to find a version number and send it through as a string right here okay at this point 
things are going to become progressively more difficult in pulling down usernames and passwords, especially once we get to the blind SQL injection, because this is something that we have not seen before. Um, so we're going to be preparing for that by going into this lab right here. You can go ahead and open it up and we are going to be pulling down the username and passwords and we're going to log in as the administrator to solve this challenge. I think uh, you can go ahead if you want and practice pulling down how many columns there are and which ones actually receive a string and you can go ahead and pause and do that if you would like. If not, we're gonna go ahead and solve it together. So we'll turn on the interceptor and we're going to be seeing some new information that we haven't seen before. It's going to seem strange, but I'm gonna do my best to explain exactly how the SQL statements work, the default tables, and what we're looking for. So we'll go ahead, send that to repeater, turn that off, send that, make sure we get our error, determine how many columns there are, string and they do. So at this point uh, things are going to be a little bit different than what we've been doing. We're actually going to be trying to pull down some information from these tables and so what we do the first thing we have to do is figure out the table name. So if we have a grid like an Excel sheet you have your columns that are going up and down, your rows that are going across and the name of the table. The first thing we have to know is the table name in order to request the columns and then individual cells within the table for us to pull down that contain the usernames and the passwords. So we have our union select and then we come in and we type in table name. And so this is what we're looking for. If you remember, we're replacing one of the null values with the table name then we leave the second one with the null value because we're not going to be pulling anything from it just yet and then we go from the information schema and this right here the information schema dot tables and this is a default table that you're going to have on every SQL database. So that's how I know this is there. If you were to go into SQL and you were to open it up, you're going to have several default tables, the information schema tables. This is default, it's always going to be there. And so this is how we know what to put in for our injection. Then we send it and we have an error, which means I'm guessing I have a typo schema there was my typo and we pull down and we'll look through our response and see the pull down the table names that we have here and there are a bunch of table names but if you remember the one we're looking for we're trying to log in as the administrator so we're going to need the users table right here users this is the name of users table i would suggest copying it and having a text file open because we're going to need this information. So now we're going to look for the column name so we can delete this. So the table column is what we're looking for now. So we're going to actually, I deleted the wrong part of the request. Instead of the table, we're looking for the column name and we're going to leave this in the information schema dot columns and this looks right and now we're going to add to this because now we're looking for the columns from a very specific table so now we add a plus and we'll say where the table name equals and then our users table that we just pulled down so we'll type in table name and then we do equals and then our double quotes 
think I've actually already got that copied still. And then we paste in our users table. So what we have going on is our union select. So everything that's coming before this uh, doesn't really matter. We're adding a query onto it. We're looking for the column name. We have our second value retrieving null because we're not looking for anything from it just yet from the information schema which is one of the defaults within the SQL database and we're, we found the table so now we're looking for columns where the table name so we're pulling down the table name equals users this is going to give us the columns within the table that is named users with some random characters and so we should be able to send this so now we should be able to scroll down and we have column names so the passwords column and the users column and so now we should be able to change our query and pull down the passwords and the username so I'm gonna go ahead and copy these we have the username and the password columns these are the ones that we are interested in and now we're going to change our union statement so now instead of pulling down a column name we are going to be looking for the username and the password so we can delete our null and we can insert the password uh, column and here we'll put in the username column in the first slot instead of the column name and we're looking for the username the password from users let's see if that works for us and it does so we should be able to come through now to solve the challenge we have the administrator and a, another user so we can copy the administrator we can come back to our lab remember to solve it we have to log in as the administrator we can paste in the administrator and then we can come back to burp and copy our password and this should solve the challenge for us okay now that was very I don't want to say complicated but it was a big jump from where we have been coming and where we've been coming from and so as we get ready to go into blind SQL injections it's going to become even more complicated so you might have to go through this lab several times and make sure that you really understand what's happening make sure that everything that's built up to this point is working together the next lab I believe is an Oracle lab okay so you can try and solve this one um, it's going to be uh, similar to the one that we just did only you can use the SQL cheat sheet uh, we'll go ahead and walk through it again just so we can have one more practice before we get into the blind SQL injections because these are going to use everything we just learned in this lesson plus quite a bit more um, we're going to be looking at new aspects within burp and exactly how to use the intruder tool within the burp program so i think it's very important at this point if i can stress it enough um, we're going to have quite a bit of practice going into the blind SQL injection but it's a lot more difficult than what we just went through if you've never done this before so go through this again if you have to make sure you understand what's happening and what's going on I want you to try and solve this lab completely on your own I'm going to give you two clues before you start but other than that you have already learned everything necessary for solving this challenge we'll go ahead and open up the lab and if you remember when we do go through an Oracle uh, database, you have to use from dual when you're trying to pull down the number of columns when it, within the table. And so since we're looking for the, we're going to have to log in as the administrator, that should give you a clue to at least how many columns are going to be within the table. 
And so the other clue I wanted to give you is if you go ahead and open up the SQL injection cheat sheet, when you pull this open, you are going to be using from all tables instead of information schema. So in the last lesson, we used information schema as our default. Well, that's not what we're going to be using this time. This time we're going to use all tables. Everything should be the same as it was last time. The only difference is we're going to be using all tables instead of information schema. And so you can go ahead with that information and try and solve this lab. And if you have gotten stuck, um, we're going to go ahead and walk through this together now. So the first thing is turn your interceptor on. We're going to go through the normal procedures here. We're going to send it to repeater, turn the intercept off, and make sure that we have our error appear, which we do. So this is telling us we have a SQL injection. We are going to pull down the number of columns. I know there's at least two because we were told that we have to log in as the administrator, which means there's at least a user's name, a username and passwords column. So we have at least two of those. And then we'll go ahead and send this and it comes back. So there are two columns. Both of these are going to have to retrieve a string in order for us to pull down a username and password. So I'll go ahead and check it anyway, but I know it's going to come through and it does. Now this is where we are going to start practicing what we learned in the previous video. So if you remember, the first thing we have to do is find the table name. So we can go ahead and type in our table name and this is from last time we used information schema but if you remember this time we're going to use all tables and there we go so this should give us all tables if you remember last time there was a bunch of them but we are looking for the users I'm guessing this is the one that we need history we're gonna go ahead and uh, pull down the information. Well, this is, uh, we'll grab a couple of them just in case, but I think that's gonna be the right one. So we'll keep this one. This is the one we're gonna roll with. Now what we'll do is we'll have to come back up here, if you remember, and change. Now that we have the table name, we're gonna go ahead and insert this and see if we can find the column name. So we'll change this to column and we'll leave our null and it is from and this time we're going to input in our table into our injection. So we have from, from all of our tables. And we're looking for, at this point, the columns where it is equal, the table is equal to the table name that we just pulled down. So we have where, and then we'll type in our table name and then equals our table name. And we'll go ahead, look this over, and then we'll send it. And it came through. Now we have to hope that we have our columns. So we have a password column pulled down, and we have the username. Okay, now we have to change our uh, injection one more time. So we will, this time we'll be getting rid of our null value and we're going to be putting in first our username and then we're also looking for the um, passwords which will come from our second column and this is going to come from our table name which I actually think we delete this, we'll delete that, and we'll delete this. And we have an error, comma, and we have pulled it down. So this should have our usernames and our passwords in it, just like the last one that we walked through. Here's the administrator and the password. And so if you remember, we have to log in to um, actually receive the solved lab up here. So we'll go ahead, 
paste that. And we'll copy and paste this and send it and we have solved the challenge and we are ready to start the blind sql injection we are going to um, go ahead and open up this lab while it's loading i thought i would just tell you this is going to be the next couple of labs are going to be a little more difficult and i think that you should practice them uh, just to get this ingrained into your mind uh, what exactly is happening because we're going to be adding quite a few new steps but they actually let us skip what we have been practicing because in the instructions they give us that we are going to be working with a table called users and two columns usernames or the username and passwords so we don't have to go find the table and we don't have to find the columns but we do have to still log in as the administrator to complete this lab so you can go ahead and open up this lab start this lab exactly how we normally would by opening up one of these tabs forwarding it and then sending our request to the repeater because what you're looking for is a request with this tracking id you need that tracking id because that's where the sql injection is going to be so we'll send this and you can send it a few times and what I'm looking for is this content length. I want to make sure that it does not change. And sometimes you will send this on some uh, web applications and it will change every time, no matter what you do, the exact same get request. But for us, in our case, it stays the same, which makes this lab much easier to solve. And when you have this tracking ID, you can also check it as well for the SQL injection. And so you send it and you can see the content length has changed. So it's 4906 and you send it and now it has changed. This tells us there is a possibility of a SQL injection. So what we're looking for is what has actually changed in our response here. What I like to do when I come across um, a different response is to copy this and take it to a text editor. I think it's easier to read through and to look at and I also can search which we are going to do right here. So when it comes back without any modifications we have the, let's send this again, we have the welcome back is on the page. When we put in our single quote to try and provoke an error, the welcome back is gone so you can see we have zero matches right here and so with our zero matches we want to send a true statement to make sure that we can really add on to this query so we go or one equals one and then comment this out that comes back as true so we know that we can give some kind of request and see what comes back true, what is actually true and is on the database will come back with this welcome back, which is what we're going to have to pay attention to. And so because we've already been told what the table name is and the column names, we can go ahead and start to look for information from this table. So we'll type in our usual union select and this is where it changes because we're going to now add a character into our query so we're going union select from and then we're going to go to our users table where the username oops username is equal to and then Remember, we were told we need to log in as administrator, so the username we're looking for, and we are going to send this and see if it comes back as true, and it does. So we have this, and now what we can do is we can actually add on to it, and we can look for the length of the password. And so you can come in here, and you can look to see how long the password is and you can pull down the length of the password and you can come in here and you can go 
plus and plus length and then we add in the password and then you would add is it greater than and then you can start right here and you can start sending to see is it greater than one is it greater than two is it greater than three um, and you can send this to the burp repeater and just continue seeing is it greater than and looking through this uh, what I am going to do is I'm actually going to skip this process for the sake of time because we're gonna have to go into a burp intruder and start looking for the actual password and so what we're going to do is we're going to send this query over to the intruder and see what we can pull back so I'm gonna go ahead and take this query here and what we're going to do is we're gonna take this and we're going to add into it the characters that we're looking for and so you would add in that you're looking for the first character and only one character inside the query and then you're going to start with the character A. Now this at this point I'm sure this is the first time you've ever seen anything like this it is it looks very strange and it is going to feel really strange doing things like this it's new and it's kind of confusing so we'll send this uh, to repeater to intruder and so we have this new string that we're sending. So we have our normal union select, and then we have a string from users where the username equals administrator. So we're looking on the table name users under the column username for the administrator's password. And we are looking for the actual password at this point and this actually I just noticed we're not looking for the length of the password we're going to be looking for the substring so we'll come over to intruder we'll look at our positions because we've already sent sent this over here we'll clear where it wants us to start querying and we are looking for the substring in the password and so we will go ahead and set this up. What we do at this point is as we set up our payload you will add the uh, whatever those symbols are to tell it this is where we want to shoot through or we're going to use the cluster bomb. So this is where we're going to be going through and sorting to make sure we have the right characters and then we'll add right here because if you remember this selects the first character and then it's going to go through the first character every for all the characters that we give it but then we want it to go through the second character as well and the third and the fourth and the fifth until we reach the end and we have the password I don't have the professional version of burp on this system and so this is actually going to go really slow and once it starts I'm going to go ahead and pause the video so you don't have to wait for it to pull down the password because it will actually take a while without the professional version of burp and so what we're going to do now is we're going to set up our payloads and so if you remember payload one is going to go to this position and payload two is going to go to this position so the first payload we're going through numbers so we will find numbers and we're going to go from one and this is when I guess it would have been helpful um, I'm just going to go really far this is when it would have been helpful to see how many characters were in the password so you would have known how far you needed to go and then we're going to go by a step of one so it's going to go up one character once it goes through all 30 characters and then position two we are going to be going through the alphabet see if it has the alphabets in here for us I believe it does manually add these in it would be a lot easier uh, to go through these without having to do this but I will edit this out alright I believe we have all of the characters added in what we can do is we can go ahead and 
start the attack and we can say okay and now it is going to go through and start working through all of those characters so position is position one and a is position two and a is position three and a and it's going to go through and check every character for each position until one returns true okay I have gone ahead and cut the video uh, in the middle of where we were after starting the attack and you can see that it's been running and we've pulled down some of the characters that we've needed one of the things that um, might be helpful if you copied exactly what I had typed in into the payload or into the query right here um, I actually had a uh, error and I had to go through and change that um, and fix it and then that ran for a little while and then also my computer fell asleep while running this and it closed out my query and so I had to restart it and so this has been running for what feels like forever and so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to stop it here and I'm going to show you a little more manual way and it's also a lot faster because if you can see it's moving one it's sending one query each time to the server and it's very slow anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds and it's because we've sent so many and this is one of the things burp does in order to get you to buy burp professional so that it'll send them really fast so they've throttled this down um, but I'm going to show you a way that you can kind of get around this and send your uh, queries a lot faster. Before we start that, I kind of wanted to show you our positions just in case it wasn't clear. Remember in our query, we are selecting um, from the users, the table users, where the username is just the column. And we're looking for the name of administrator inside the password column. And so we're sending, well, this is the first character in the query, so this would be position number one, and then it'll change, and it'll go position number two, and then position number three, and it will send A all the way through, however many we set those positions, one, two, three, four, five, six, to see if an A comes back as true in any of those cases. And if it comes back true, we'll see something like this. You can see the length has changed, and the welcome back is present in the response. And then it, once it goes to all of position one for all of the alphabet, it will go to B and then it will start over and it will continue and it will go through like that. This is a very automated way. We don't have to really do anything. We just set it up and let it run. But if you don't have Burp Professional, this can take a very long time. And one thing before we go ahead and I show you how to organize this to find the password is that in order to get this welcome back to show up what you do is you can check in your response and you can have your welcome down here and if you can see these it matches the welcome has come back which means it's true and we have a match for these down here it is not true and there is no match and so we can sort out the true characters that exist and in which position they exist so there's a g in position two there's a g in position 15 we have a K in position 8 and so on and so we can know this is where there's characters and this is how it's true but in order to get this welcome up here you have to go into your options you will come down so it'll start you up here you'll scroll down to grep match you will clear what's in here and you will add welcome you'll get a little pop-up you'll just click OK and then it will bring you back to your results and it will look like this and what you do is you just click this and you click it again until we have the arrow facing down and it will have all of the characters there for you as it runs. Now the way I like to sort out the password is to have a text file open which is right here. We have our text file. We'll delete this and we'll delete this and we'll paste this in. So what we have here we'll also delete these because these are just our query numbers on how many um, get requests were sent to the server and I think the less numbers we have the easier that this will be to understand so this if you remember let's open this back up and have our text file this is the position uh, from payload number one and this is the character that has come back in payload number two so what you would do so let's say this is what we've brought back 
and the and the query is finished even though we know it's still running and it's going to take five more hours for it to finish running so what we'd do is we'd have our password equals and you'd come here and you'd go okay position number one is i and then we'd look for two two is o position number three is a k and then position number four is an i and position number five l and position six is a g and then you'd go along and you would just continue doing this all the way through so we go six and then we go seven and then eight is a c nine is in and by the time you've gone through all of this this is your password and so we were told that the username is administrator and the password is what we're pulling down right here and we'd come over here we'd go to our lab and this is where we would come in we'd click log in you would use administrator and then this password that we have just pulled down so if you want to let your intruder run for ever because it is really slow especially once you get past about position um, after you get past request number 30 to 35 it really slows down so I'm gonna go ahead and close this out okay we are going to look at the blind SQL injection with time delays so what you'll do is if you find what you believe to be a SQL injection you will inject a time delay and they're pretty simple um, but I also want to look at the cheat sheet because they're going to be different and we're only going to be looking at this one right here the blind SQL injection with time delays is really simple simple to the one with conditional responses which we just looked at the only difference is you would be running a case then statement, which if you're a programmer, it's like if then, and uh, you're, go you're going to be saying if this is true, then sleep, and rather than if this is true. So with the cheat sheet, um, these are all going to be different. So you'll have to run this to get your program to sleep. You know, for your delay with Microsoft, it's going to be like your syntax is going to look like this for PostgreSQL is going to look like this and MySQL is going to look like this. And so each one is going to be a little different and you might have to just try each one and see what comes back for you. Okay, so this is, um, we're gonna have to, to solve the lab, we need it to sleep for 10 seconds, which is kind of a long wait, but 10 seconds feels like forever when you're waiting for a response a, a get, to a get request. So we will go ahead and turn the interceptor on. Open this up. I think I clicked in the wrong spot. Oh, there's a tracking ID. We have one right there. And this will look, let's see if it's, it says it's blind, so it's not going to have anything for us. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and go to an item so that I know I'm in the right spot and you guys don't have to watch me fumble around like you are right now. So we'll go ahead, send that to repeater and the equal objection that we're looking for with the time delay is the Postgres, uh, PostgreSQL right here. So what we'll do is we'll use this syntax right here, the PG sleep 10, and we're going to have to concatenate it to our query so it's just two types which is just above your enter key or your return key if you're on a Mac and then you just type in the syntax exactly like you just saw and then we don't forget to comment out the rest and that should take 10 seconds for our response to come back and once that response comes back we should have a solved up here and so the time delays are really simple uh, they're really easy to run and this is how you do it i'm not sure why they didn't come back as solved maybe we have to go ahead and forward this there it is there's the solved so they're really simple to run. Um, they're really easy proof of concept. Uh, you can change this to five seconds if you're impatient like I am and wait just five seconds instead of 10, but you have to do 10 here to solve the lab. Okay, we are ready to start directory traversal. 
Uh, we have talked about this just a little bit earlier when we talked about navigating through files and we talked about going through files such as this. So we would CD into the desktop and it changes us. We change into that directory. And so we're able to go between directories and go into different files. And the way we go backward, if you remember, if I wanted to go back to my home, um, I would just go back one directory and that takes me back. A good way to practice it, practice this, and maybe you've done this earlier, is to open up your home folder and just up here in your little search bar, you can practice going backwards or you can practice going forwards. And so we would just be uh, going forwards like this and then we can go forward again and we can go into our desktop. And then if we wanted to go back, we would just do two dots and a slash. And so in directory traversal, we will be going through files only on in our browser. So we would be going backward through here. And we talked about this a little bit in the previous lessons. And so we're going to go ahead and open up our port swigger in our labs. And you can scroll down until you find the directory traversal. And then we're going to walk through a few of these manually. And then I'm going to show you a tool that does this for you. And I will uh, pull up a directory traversal that is found on Hacker One, just so you can look at it and you can see um, just that these are not something that's lost out there and somebody's found them all. Actually, recently, I would say within the last two years, someone found a bunch of directory traversals, they were able to pull down files that they should have never had access to on the Department of Defense. And so if you would think of any organization that's going to have good security, you would think it would be the DOD. And these were found recently within the last two years, directory traversals on the DOD. And so it's out there and they happen. I've actually found a few of them and uh, we'll go through them manually and then I'll show you a easy way to fuzz through with a tool that will actually pull down um, and tell you where a website is or web application is vulnerable and exactly which exploit they used to prove it's vulnerable. So we'll do that after we go through some of these manually. Okay, we are ready to go ahead and open up our first lab and you're going to be able to see just how easy these are to find manually as uh, they're, I think they're really simple and anyone can go and try these with really knowing very little about how the web application or locating files works in general. You can pretty, pretty much find these straight off your very first day. So we'll go ahead and access the lab and turn this on, uh, turn on our lab. And while that's opening, there's a few ways, a few different ways to look for these. Probably the most common is going to be up here in your address bar. You'll come up here and this is where you'll search for them. And I'll just go ahead and show you. Uh, what you would do is you'd pull this open and you'd hit your slash and you'd go dot dot slash dot dot slash. And then you would hit enter and see if it can take you back any files but it is not going to work for us in this bar we're actually going to have to use burp for this and so we'll go ahead and turn it on turn our intercept on and we'll uh, view details and so what i'm going to go ahead and do is send a few of these requests to repeater because i'm not actually sure where exactly we're going to find the traversal so we'll go ahead and send that to repeater as well and I think that's it. So we'll go ahead and open this. And so if you remember how to go backward in our files, we'll actually start with the first one we sent. Um, we'll go ahead and delete this. And so we're looking for the product ID and you would go dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash. And then what we're looking for, if you remember in the lab description is the Etsy password. And so we just type in ETC slash password, and then you can send it and it says we get a bad request. And so we'll go a couple more and see what happens. Okay, so we're getting a bad request. What we'll do is we'll go over to our other get, uh, get request 
and we'll go ahead and do the same thing. I like to go ahead and start out just like this and then add to the uh, path traversal um, as we go. And so I just go just like this and see how far we have to go before we can actually find the files, in this case, before we solve the lab. Okay, so there it solved it. So it goes back to the root folder, and then it goes forward into this file, and then it'll go forward into the password file, and it pulls down for us information that we should not be able to have access to. And so for us, this should solve the lab for us. So each one of these just goes back one file and it goes back until it hits the root folder and then it'll go forward into this directory into this file. And that will give us information that we should not otherwise have access to. Okay, we are ready to go ahead and solve our second lab on path traversal. So you can go ahead um, I think with what you have learned so far in the very first lab, you should be able to solve the second lab on the directory traversal. So if you want to go ahead and give it a try, you can open up the lab, which I've already done, and you will be looking for the same file we were looking for last time, the Etsy password file, and that will solve the lab for you. And so you can go ahead and pause the video now and see if you can solve this challenge. Okay, how did that go? Hopefully you were able to solve it without any trouble. If not, we're gonna go ahead and walk through it now. We'll go ahead and turn on our interceptor and we will click one of the view details just to make sure we can pull down the same get request we had last time, which was not the product ID. It was the image file, the image file name. So we'll go ahead and send that to repeater. And while we're over here, we're gonna start out just the same way we did last time. We're gonna come in here and start with our Etsy password. And then as necessary, if we need to, need to we'll go ahead and add in the dot dot slashes. But we always start um, at the beginning and go forward if, or go backward if necessary. So we'll go ahead and send this and it came back on the first try. So hopefully you were able to solve that challenge um, because they're gonna get a little more challenging to do manually, um, but not all that difficult for us. Okay, we are ready for the third challenge that we are going to be looking at for the path traversal. And this one, we're actually told what's happened. So go ahead and open up this lab and we'll see our instructions here. And we're told that the sequence is stripped away non-recursively. And so what we will have to do is modify the attack just a little bit and pretty regularly, especially with cross-site scripting, you will see um, developers that know of a way or maybe a few ways that an attack can be performed. And so they'll just go ahead and strip out just specific uh, elements or sequences within a within an attack or a payload so that they won't go through but there's almost always another way to pull this off and so actually in this lesson and the next one we're going to um, be able to observe just how you change payloads and really in bug bounty hunting what you're going to be doing is a lot of trial and error until something works and so we'll go ahead open up this lab and once you're in here you will uh, click view details after you've turned on your intercept. We'll go ahead and turn that on. And my son would think this is the coolest toy ever. And so we'll go ahead and view the details. We'll get our get request that we need right here. We'll send it to repeater. We'll turn the intercept off. And once we're in here, we'll go ahead and we can start out with the Etsy password. And then we'll send this and it comes back with a bad request. And so you can go ahead and try going back and it comes back with a bad request. And I actually know what is going on because we're told 
um, that the traversal sequence is stripped away. So what we'll have to do is try something different. And so what you can actually do is go four dots with two slashes. And then this is going to be a different process in pulling down the Etsy password file. So we'll send this. And then we will, one, two, three, four, continue going. And we are able to find the file we need. Now, when it comes to remembering all of these different ways that you can try and find a directory traversal, it is not necessary to try and remember these. I'm going to show you a tool that actually does all of this for you with hundreds and hundreds of different ways to pull down an Etsy password file. And so I'm just showing you manually how this works so that you know what's going on and you know how to find these. Um, just in case you're not allowed to run a scanning tool or anything like that on a specific web application. But you do not need to try and remember all of these different ways to pull down the Etsy password file because you will have sources available that can do it for you or remind you exactly how to pull off these attacks. Okay, we are going to be working through our final path traversal before we look at how to do this with the automated tool and so you can go ahead and open up this lab and in here we can read our instructions and exactly how to pull this off and so we're told that this has url decode in it and so this is actually um, very similar to a exploit that was pulled off uh, and I came across this not too long ago when I was looking through uh, patch traversals and how they were pulled off on the Hacktivity. And so we have, this was done June 9th, 2018. So um, quite a while ago, a couple years, but this is going to be pretty much the exact same exploit we're going to be doing in this lab. So just to show you that these um, labs aren't just theoretical, but they actually do help you perform these exploits and so you can see here this is the url encoding and so a simple way to look at url encoding is you can come over here to the decoder you can type in some gibberish and then you can encode it as url and you will see the url encoding pull down here and so what we are going to be doing is doing something very similar to what this guy has done here and you can actually see he actually paste um, it pulls down the file that he should not have access to so what we are going to do is come in here you open up the lab click access the lab same as we've been doing in the last few lessons we'll open up burp turn on the intercept and we will view details of one of the files we will look for the get request with the image file name send it to repeater and now what we're going to do is very similar to what we just saw. So we'll start out just like normal. You can go ahead and send this. And then we are going to type in the uh, URL uh, encoded version because it's going to decode it for us, which is percent %252F. And that should pull it down for us and we'll go ahead and delete that because it's encoded in there and so we can send that I'm going to do rather than type this is I'm going to go ahead and copy it and then paste it and then send it and then paste it and then send and there we found the file and so you can actually uh, really easily see how this is very practical here we're practicing it here someone actually pulled it off on a live website and so if we come in here and we turn our proxy off we should solve the lab and so in the next lesson uh, you are going to be required to open up juice shop because this is the uh, url we're going to be using to pull off the attack on our automated tool so you can go ahead and 
open up juice shop and get it running okay we are going to be looking at the automated way to find directory traversal exploits and so you can go ahead and open up a terminal and have juice shop open and running and just to make sure you have the tool installed you can come down to your terminal and you can type in sudo apt get install should look exactly like this and then you will hit enter it will require your password and you can go ahead and type that in and it will run and it might ask you are you sure you want to install and you can press y and then hit enter or return if you're on a mac and it will install and so the way to run this tool is very very simple um, you would just type in dot dot pwn and then we will give it the parameters that we want it to follow so we'll just type in dot dot pwn and then we will go dash m and this is I actually already ran it just to make sure it would run on our local um, server and so this is what you will type in you will type in dot dot pwn and then you'll flag m http and then you'll flag h and it's our local host and so i actually just came up here and copied and pasted the page i was on and when you hit run it will run for us oh it did not run for us because we have to run it as sudo as our super user and now it is running and it'll ask us press enter to start the testing and then we'll go ahead and hit enter and now you can see look it is running all of those for us with the dot dot slash dot dot slash and then it encodes it and it just runs through and it tells us even where it's vulnerable now this web application is vulnerable i think it's vulnerable to all of them uh, they did not do a good job when building the web application for uh, making it secure to this attack and it will run and there are hundreds of different ways to send there's the one we just saw with the percent 252 f and it is runs it for you and it'll tell you for us it would have been right here we would have had three paths to go back before it goes forward into the etsy password and so it would have found it right here it would have flagged it as vulnerable so now you can see just how easy it is to run this with this tool and you can go ahead and hit command c to close out of it so that it'll stop running and it might have actually went ahead and solved a challenge for you if it didn't you can go ahead and type in uh, dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash really any of these because it says it's vulnerable to them and then type in etc slash password and it should pull down i think i already solved the challenge um, it should pull down that we have accessed a file that you should not have had access to and so that will solve that challenge for you it's pretty simple running this tool is really easy and it takes a lot of the manual testing that we just did out of account for us and it will run uh, hundreds of different ways to find a path traversal okay we're going to start by looking at the xml injection at this point and we're going to start a really easy xml injection this is one that you're going to see that's probably the most common and then from here we're going to look at some more uncommon xml injection methods but they're going to be a lot more severe and so this first one is really simple you can go ahead and open up this lab on port swigger right here and i want to walk you through we'll go ahead and click access lab i want to walk you through what is happening so when we look at this xml injection i want to focus just on these two lines when you see this xxe right here we can change this to be anything we want and we see it down here it is the same thing this is the xxe being called and telling the xml file that we want it to do something right here so we're going to tell the system to open up the etsy passwd file and so i will show you what this looks like when you come up here and you click view detail we will need to turn on burp and forward this to repeater and we can now turn this off and we're going to need this right here so we can copy and we'll paste it in right here at the top 
And now we're gonna delete this first part right here. And we're going to change, we can leave our, I guess we'll leave our doc type as foo. And we're gonna change this right here to Etsy. And this right here to pass WD. And then down here where it says the product ID, what we're gonna do is we want to call this right here to tell the system we want it to do something. So if you remember what this looked like over here, we have the and XXC with the colon, we need burp, and it, where that product ID was, we can paste this in. And now we'll send it and see if we have any errors, and we do not. And it provides for us the Etsy passwd file. This is a pretty big vulnerability. This is something you shouldn't be able to look at. This is a this is actually this is something you shouldn't be able to look at. And it will give us users that are on the system. So from here we're gonna move on to try hack me. And we have a juice shop, which is a really great place to practice a lot of web application vulnerabilities and we will hop over here and pop open a machine and I'll show you a file upload XML injection. We'll come over to OWASP G-Shop. You will need to click on login and create an account. So I'm gonna create an account and then we'll be back at the home page, and I'll show you where to start from there. Okay, so we are all logged in and we are now at the front page. We'll come up here to the three lines. We're gonna say we want to file a complaint and we'll just say a bunch of gibberish. And now we're going to need to upload a file. So we will create our XML file by coming over here and gedit, and this is what we'll just name our file, so that way we know what it is. I'm gonna make this on my desktop so that it's easy to find. And now we need our code to inject with. So we'll copy this. We can move it over here to our file, and then we'll just change this to Etsy, pass, WD, and save it close it and come back over here to juice shop and click browse we go to our desktop we want all files xxe open we need burp to intercept this so we'll come back to our proxy intercept and submit send this to repeater I actually don't remember which one this is so we're going to send a couple of them uh, we'll send this and we'll just turn repeater off and hope we got it so it says we've solved several of the challenges we'll come to repeater we'll go back here to the first one we'll send it and right here is the past wd file it doesn't come back in quite as nice a format as our original one that we had done on port swigger here but we have the xml the XML injection worked and we have the passwd file and here's the root user. So this is a file upload XML injection and now we're going to cover a XML injection that's going to lead us to remote code execution and you can actually see right here they tell us remote code execution if we are lucky and the PHP accept module is loaded we can get remote code execution and we're going to go ahead and try this but this is on hack the box and if you don't have a subscription to hack the box that's okay this would be something i have never seen outside of hack the box but it's something to be aware of so we'll go ahead and i'll open up hack the box launch the box and get all set up and then i'll walk you through an xml injection with hack the box all right i have popped open here for us the hack the box machine this is the landing page and if you run a Durbuster or Fuff, you will find this db.php. And then we have the portal.php, and we click this, and we are brought to this page. Now, if we go to test it, grab our interceptor, and we just put something in here, and we send it. We'll send this to repeater, turn this off, send and we have this value right here data and this is what we get back we have this data parameter right here we can copy it 
come to our decoder and we can decode as URL, decode as base64, and we see we have this XML, we get an XML return that has been base64 encoded and then URL encoded. And so what we can do with this is try and add to it or adjust it and see if we can pull off an XXE attack by just reversing this. We can add in our own payload and then we can encode it as base64 and then URL encode it and put it back into the repeater tab right here. So what we'll do is come over and we'll just try to pull down the, we'll try to pull down the Etsy pass WD file first. Okay, one other way to look at this that is a lot easier rather than just coming into the repeater, coming into the decoder and decoding this as URL and then base64 to get to the XML file is we can go to our repeater and remember we have this data here, we can come over to our inspector and then we can click this little arrow right here and it will automatically decode this for us and we will land right here and we can actually do our changes right here apply changes and resend this and get our input brought our response brought back to us so what we will do is come over we'll go to OWASP and we will grab the XML right here the XXE we'll open this up to grab our payload. This is not the one we were in earlier, but that is okay. So what we will grab is the doc type and the file system and we'll stop right here. We can copy this. We'll put this on a new line right here. We'll actually try to see if this will let us put this all on one line so that it looks better for us. Now that we have this on, well, not one line, but it's a little better. Here we go. There we go. Now it's on one line. So what we're going to do is similar to what we've been doing before is we can just leave this however we want. We're actually going to delete this. We don't really need that. And it looks a little better for us. This goes on a different line. I guess we'll leave it. Okay. So here we go. What we can do at this point is type in Etsy slash pass WD. And then down here, we need to call the XXE. So we can go our and symbol XXE and our semicolon and apply changes. And if we send this response, you can see right here, we have the pass WD file brought down for us. And so one of the things we always should look at, especially when we are on a hack the box, some kind of CTF or even a pen test or a bug bounty program, you really wouldn't do this, but you would look for the users because you may be able to attack some of them. So we have the development user, here's the user ID, we have root obviously up here. And what you can do is just look for the ones that have been bash and those are the ones that will have a shell available on them. So we have development and root and a quick look. I'm not really seeing any others. And now what we can do is try to pull down that db.php file. But in order to do that, you will have to use a PHP wrapper. And those are something I would suggest learning because you will see them every now and then whenever you see a PHP system. Running, a lot of times you can thank PHP Wrapper and see if you can pull down information that you should not be able to. And there's a lot of different places you can use those PHP wrappers, but one of those places is going to be right here. So instead of pulling down a file, what we're gonna do is we're gonna type in here PHP and we can delete all of this and type in filter slash convert dot base 64 dash encode slash resource equals and instead of the etsy pass wd file what we're going to be looking for is the db.php and you can find this typically if you're familiar with 
doing CTFs or any kind of pen testing, you will know that the you can find the files inside on you can find the files for a web application inside of var slash dub 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 slash html slash db dot php and this is pretty standard for where you're going to find files on a linux system and we can apply changes we can copy this we can go to the decoder paste this in and as we decode it with base64 it tells us that we have this in our response so this would be what was brought back with our php filter and we have a username right here we have the database name, we have a password right here, and we should be able to SSH in as the development user using this password right here because we know password. it's really common for people to reuse their passwords, and this will actually lead to remote code execution. So if we come over here and we say SSH, and then we say, what was, make sure we had that user right, I think it was development at... 10, 10, 11, 100. We might have to grab that user again. We'll say yes. And come over to the decoder, grab the password, and paste that in. And it worked. So this is how you can get remote code execution on the box using on a server using XXE. And so with that, this one was really complex, but XML injection is something you should look into and try to learn. I would suggest going back to Port Swigger and maybe practicing a few of their XXE challenges as well as Juice Shop and just play around with it until you feel like you are comfortable and you understand what is going on. So there are three different ways that you can use XXC in the cybersecurity testing world. Okay, one of the most common vulnerabilities is going to be cross-site scripting, or it's also known as XSS. And uh, this vulnerability is common, but it's also going to be pretty hard to exploit without knowing some form of HTML and JavaScript. So there are basic payloads that you can go in and you can just test a bunch of them. And I'm going to show you a list um, that I found. It's got over 6,500 um, different ways to uh, try and exploit this, but most of the time you're going to have to inspect the page and modify the content. But we'll get to that in just a little bit. I'm going to show you uh, just a couple of cross-site scripting examples here. Um, and then I kind of want to show you the code of what's going on. I think you'll be able to understand it even if you know zero programming. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and I'll show you an example of what cross-site scripting is and then I'll explain why it's so dangerous. And so um, this is going to be the most basic, simple form of cross-site scripting. Uh, and so all we want to do is have an alert pop up. And uh, if you can pop up an alert on a bug bounty program, you will be able to submit that for a vulnerability. Uh, and there you'll see them a lot, of, a lot of places. A lot of people like to look for them. I don't really look for them all that often because I think most people look for these. And if it's not stored cross-site scripting, then you're not really going to get paid for the amount of time that you put in. You'll get paid, but just not for not enough for the amount of time it's going to take to find them. So um, we're going to do this with an image, an image tag. So we'll go image, source, equals, and then we leave it blank. And when this is blank, it's going to make an error on the page. And so on error, we want to alert which is going to give us the um, ability to pull off the cross-site scripting. And we're just going to alert one, and then we will close the tag. And I have made a mistake somewhere. 
let's go ahead and delete this equal sign there it is so we have the alert pop up and it says localhost one now what you can do with a cross site scripting and why it's so dangerous is not because you can just pop things up on somebody's screen but what you're able to do is you could make this look really fancy and you could say log into Wi-Fi or log into this page or you're you were accidentally logged out and people can type in their username and their password and then all of a sudden you have their credentials you can put alert document dot cookie right here and then all of a sudden uh, you can steal their session and so there's uh, quite a few different ways that you can use this to get malicious with it and so that's why uh, it's so dangerous but it's also uh, really common. It's going to be in the top 10 vulnerabilities that you're going to find on pretty much any list. And so right here is a different version. So right here is just plain as can be. Um, you can type whatever you want and nothing's going to get blacklisted. So right here um, I have made a little, it's really short, it only has the image tag, but you can type your script the image has been blacklisted. So what I mean by that is if you watch what happens every I finish typing image and it automatically deletes it. This will happen on programs that you're going to test. So they'll have characters that are blacklisted. I have come across it. I come across it regularly. I have come across blacklisted characters when I was trying to do a SQL injection. So you'll come across blacklisted characters. What you'll do um, is you can go out and you can find encoders and you can encode your payloads in order to fit your specific needs. And uh, in this case, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is go I and make a capital M and a G and it doesn't get deleted or you could go capital I M G and this is a way that you'll find especially in capture the flags to bypass um, blacklisted characters or um, words is you just change it a little bit or you can encode it and you can bypass the filter and so we could do the exact same thing that we had done before so we'll go on error um, equal alert and then we'll just do alert one and then we'll close it off and there's the alert so all we really had to do was just change the image tag because the image had been blacklisted but we were allowed to pull up a different version of the image tag and so what this looks like um, here we have banned characters so you, you can have ban and uh, characters such as these, people will uh, ban these characters so that you can't inject your code into it. So, but we will, I will show you. Uh, so in this case, I actually ban this character, the backslash. So no matter how many times I push it, it's not going to come in. But you can still um, ban this. You will find the backslash ban because if you can't close a tag, then it's going to be really hard to pull off a cross-site scripting. Not impossible, <clears throat> but you can still do it. So what this looks like is I am just replacing the image with an empty string. And over here we have the banned characters. You can see right here, <clears throat> you're not allowed to use those, and I replace them with an empty string. And so this is what a blacklist would look like. You just have a bunch of characters listed that are blacklisted and you're not allowed to type them in. So when you have a banned black, uh, backslash, um, which you're probably only going to see in capture the flags, uh, some, something like this, uh, but what you can do is you can actually make a button tag like this. If I can get that right, there we go. And then you can just type something in here. And then what you can do is you can type in on click equal, and then you do the same thing. You'd put your alert, and we'll put our one, and we don't have to have a closing tag. We don't have to close that. So we click it, and there's the alert. And uh, 
you will see this in one of our practice uh, when we practice the cross-site scriptings. So those are uh, just a few ways you can pull off the cross-site scripting. I want to show you um, a page that has a ton of cross-site scripting payloads. And here it is. You can actually just Google uh, cross-site cr cross scripting payloads, which we'll go ahead and I'll just do it right now and walk you through it. We'll just type in payloads and just click the first one. And here's going to be a list. So you can, ha you can get an idea of how many are out there and different ways you can do a cross-site scripting. And so you, this is why I'm telling you there's a lot of different ways to do these. We'll actually see one similar to this in just a few lessons because you have to, we're going to have to close off a tag and then we're going to have a um, character blocked and then we'll actually be able to insert the payload. So th there's a ton of different ways to pull these off. It, it's going to require some knowledge of HTML and JavaScript. Or you can, if you're on a capture the flag, you can just go to Burp Intruder and you can just send this entire list until you are able to receive the solved challenge. Uh, but with that, this is a basic introduction into cross-site scripting and we'll get a little more hands-on and I'll have you guys start practicing um, writing your own payloads in the coming lessons. Okay, for this challenge I want you to come to the hacker one or the hacker 101 uh, CTF this is uh, hacker one's practice site for us to practice what we've learned um, and you can come in here to the easy with two flags <clears throat> and click go if you would like the challenge um, we have already saw the XSS in this challenge. I showed it to you uh, in the last lesson. So if you want to go ahead and look for it on your own, uh, you can go ahead and do that. I think you have the knowledge to uh, solve this challenge all on your own without any help. But I will do a walkthrough here in just a second. So if you would like the challenge, you can go ahead and see if you can find the cross site scripting. Um, and you can do that now. Okay, once we're in here, um, you can go through and one of the th first things, if you remember from the recon lesson, is to click through and just open up everything in the page and just see what you can find uh, and what you can do. I actually just thought of another way to try and solve this challenge um, that I might try and see if it works. And then we'll, you can come back and you can go back to the home page, you can create a new page and you can just click through. Uh, and see what you can find. But in the markdown, they actually give us a clue as to how to solve this challenge. You have this random button here, it doesn't do anything. But if you edit this page, we have the tag for a button. So if you were unable to find this, you can go ahead and try and solve the challenge now. Because if you remember, if we have a button, we can come in here and we can go on click and then we can put in our alert and then we can put in one. And so we have our on click here and it's closed off and we should be able to save this. And on our click, we are given the alert. I just thought of, uh, I bet we could copy this. Just, there's another way you could have solved this. If you didn't see this button here and uh, you didn't have this clue, but you came into the testing and edited and you saw this, you might have thought to go ahead and just insert your own button and you could have pulled off the same thing just on a different page. We'll go ahead and change this to just click, just so you can see it's a different button on a different page. And we could have done the same thing. So that is another way uh, that we're able to pull this off. 
um, and we're going to see a couple of uh, a couple of more examples and the reason for this is the cross-site scripting is a rabbit hole that you can go down um, indefinitely there are thousands and thousands of different ways to pull this off and so I just want to show you the basic introduction into cross-site scripting because without knowing uh, HTML and JavaScript it's going to be kind of challenging to pull these off and since this is a beginner course I'm not really expecting any software developers to be in here wondering how to do a cross-site scripting because if you're a developer you're going to already know because you will have had to uh, write code to defend against it. Okay, we are going to come back to Port Swigger and we're just going to do a few of these just so you get an idea of how cross-site scripting works and how people can attack it and just a little more uh, understanding of seeing these um, in context of how they relate to um, pulling off these vulnerabilities, especially um, to beginners as uh, you can just copy and paste some of these into search engines and search bars and um, you will see them on hacker one and the hacktivity and just so you understand what's going on so we'll go ahead and open up this first lab here and we will be told what we are supposed to do so we're supposed to call the alert function in order to solve the lab and this one is going to be one of the most basic cross-site scriptings um, that we're going to see. And uh, one of the common ways to check to see if uh, a website or a web application has any um, defense against cross-site scripting in a search bar like this, um, what you can do is you can come in, in here and this is basic uh, JavaScript. So we just type in script and then we type alert one and then we close the script tag so this is just a basic javascript uh, command here i can type and so if this uh, has no um, sanitization then this should work and uh, you can try these in search bars you can um, try them and post uh, this script to any kind of social media outlet for the web application and see if it pulls back uh, any cross-site scripting so we'll go ahead and search this and it says we have timed out because I opened the lab um, before I started this video so we'll go ahead and reopen the lab and let that load and we'll go ahead and once this is loaded I will uh, actually just paste that in go ahead and paste that in and we'll search it and it pulls back the alert we were able to alert one and it says we have solved this challenge now in the next challenge we are going to go over the DOM cross-site scripting which I actually think is down here because this is one that we have seen with the inner HTML this one right here so if you would like to go ahead and open this up and give it a try and see if you can get this to pull the alert we have um, looked at this payload before it's not new to you you will have seen it you can go ahead and try and find it on your own okay so how did you get along with that challenge so we can actually come in here this is the lab we're going to be working on we can open it up and we're going to be setting what we type in to the inner HTML which means what we are typing in and searching for is going to be saved on the client side which means it will try and render it this is what I set up when we looked at the very first examples on the application that I tried to give you examples I if you go back and look at it this says dangerously set inner HTML um, which is just inner HTML with the react framework and so this is going to be the exact same um, type of vulnerability that we have already witnessed at the beginning of this section on cross-site scripting 
So you can go ahead and open up the lab and we'll have our search bar and we're going to be doing essentially the same thing we did in the beginning where what we type in <clears throat> is going to be rendered on this page. And so we can type in our image and then we'll do our source, which is where it's going to look for the source. You can actually uh, type anything in here. <clears throat> and so it's going to look for a file saved then this application with this name and it's not going to find it. And so that's going to cause an error. And what do we want to do on error? We want to alert. And then here you would put your um, proof of concept because we just want to prove that this works and you can type in XSS or you can type in one or you can type in whatever you want. And we will go ahead and close that off and we can search this. And there is the alert for us. And so with that, that solves this lab. And we're going to try one more. And I'm going to show you kind of this is a little more towards the intermediate level of cross site scripting, but it's just a way for you to know more about cross site scripting. And if you come across it and you really think there is a cross site scripting vulnerability in a website, uh, just how you can work through that and maybe do some more research on your own to try and exploit it. Okay, this next lab is going to be one that it's going to give an example of what it looks like to start looking for cross-site scripting in a little more of an intermediate or advanced way. Uh, this is going to be probably the most common way that this is going to be found because you're going to have to inspect the element and know how to break out of the HTML or the string that you're stuck in in order to pull off JavaScript and run it within the application. So we're actually going to go ahead and open up this one right here. And it'll be over here. It'll tell us what we need to do. And we just need to break out of the JavaScript string and call the alert function. So I went ahead and opened this up. And the most common way to do something like this is type in something that you can remember what you typed or something really easy to find. So we'll type in one, two, three, four, and we'll hit search. And now what we'll do is inspect the element, or you can view page source. We'll actually do that. That'll be a lot easier to see. So we'll view page source, and then we find our one, two, three, four, five. But this is not where we're going to be breaking out of this. See, this is a script tag. The search term right here, we searched for one, two, three, four, five. And we have the closing script tag here. So in order to close out of this, we can actually put a script tag up here in our search query, and it will close all this off. This script tag will match this script tag. And then we should be able to open up a new script tag, and it will run in the order. It'll run all of this in the order that it is laid out. And then we should be able to put in our payload. So we'll come back to our lab. And what we should be able to do is close off the previous script tag. So that will close this tag and everything before it will be inside that tag. And then we should be able to come in here and type in our own payload. And so we'll go script alert and we will just alert one. And then we can close off our payload and look at it make sure it looks right and that should work and then we'll go ahead and search it and there is the alert which means we've solved the challenge and everything after that script tag will get rendered on the page because it doesn't have an opening tag um, if you're wondering why this showed up. So we'll go ahead and we'll look at the page source and I'll show you 
the difference. See, here is where we closed off that script tag. And then here we put in our payload. And then because this script doesn't have an opening tag, this just gets rendered on the page as plain HTML. So if you are unfamiliar with programming, um, this probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. But when it comes to cross-site scripting, it's kind of going to be necessary to understand HTML and um, basic JavaScript in order to pull this off. But um, the reason I included this in this beginner course is because cross-site scripting is one of the most common vulnerabilities. And so I wanted you to be aware of it and maybe you can um, practice it and see if you can get better. Uh, or if you want to before you take the intermediate course is go learn some basic HTML and some basic JavaScript. It won't take long. You can learn HTML in a week. You can learn CSS, which is how to make a website look pretty in a very short amount of time, a couple of days. And then you can learn basic JavaScript probably in another week. It doesn't take long. It's pretty simple to learn. Um, and so I wanted to show you cross-site scripting. I want you to be aware of it. Like, look at how many cross-site scripting labs exist on um, Port Swigger. And I think they actually have, yeah, DOM vulnerabilities. So even more cross-site scripting. So there's a bunch, a bunch of cross-site scripting. It's really common, um, but it does take some programming knowledge to solve. And so with that, I will see you in the next video. What comes next is usually the question of what kind of programming do I need to know? So in this video, what we're going to cover is the Python that I think you need to know as you're entering into cybersecurity. This is an introductory course into Python for the purpose of cybersecurity. I have tried to keep it as streamlined as possible to keep you away from having to watch a six hour course on Python for cybersecurity that is just full of stuff that I think you're not really going to need in the future. So this is a beginner course. And if you have any questions as you're going through it, please leave some questions down in the comments to go ahead and show you guys how to install PyCharm on your Linux VM. If you have a Mac or Windows, it's really straightforward. You just go to the JetBrains, you download PyCharm. I'll have this link in the description and you'll click Windows, Mac or Linux, and then you'll just hit download and it will automatically start to download unless you're on Linux. So I have had to do this for several virtual machines that I have had. It won't download. And so what you have to do is right click the direct link and you'll copy link then you will you will go to your terminal and you'll run a wget wherever you want this file to be saved so if you want its own pycharm folder put it in its own pycharm folder for me it is in my downloads and you can save it wherever you want you'll hit enter this might take a little bit depending on your speed that you your internet speed and then you're going to unzip it wherever you downloaded it with this command right here and then it will unzip a bunch of files will come out and then you will be able to cd into the folder so for me i will cd into my downloads because that's where it is and then i'll go into pycharm and then i'll ls inside here and i'll go into my bin and then this is the executable i want to launch in order to launch pycharm so I will type in bash and then I will type in pycharm.sh and it will automatically launch pycharm for me. So this is how you get pycharm on Linux. If you are wanting it on your Linux, I usually write everything on my Mac. And then if I need to run the code over on Linux, I will pull it over to my Linux machine and run it over here. So with that, we will get started in the next section. All right, we are ready to start our Python course. So we're going to start out very simply with a string. A string is a sentence that is a data type. So we're going to have several different data types coming up, but a string looks very simple. It is what I think of as a sentence in English. So you just have hello world. A string is always going to be stored inside of quotations. So if we were to print this, it would print right here 
hello world for us. And if we change it, it's going to change along with us. So this is really simply, this is a string and we can store strings inside variables, which is going to be coming up in the next section. But first, before we go on, you will see sometimes that you need a string on a new line, especially if you're going to export something into a CSV file, you're going to want things on new lines. And at the end of your string, you can type something like this and then say, hello world number two. And then we can print this and we have hello world and hello world number two. And if I wanted to get rid of that space, I would do it this way. So we have hello world and hello world number two. Another way to go about printing this would be like this. So print, print, and then we put our quotations and we say hello. And then we can add this like this, hello world, just like that. And now if we were to print it, we have hello world, hello world number two, and then hello world. You see how there's no space right here? This is something that I run into regularly and I just had happen the other day. There's two different ways you can put a space right here. And I'm gonna show you the easiest way first is just to add a space right there, rerun it, and now you have a space. But I think it's helpful to know more than one way to do this. So you can add another quotation and put a space in there and add another plus sign. So you can run it this way and you still have that space. And it's really important to know this right here because sometimes you'll be running a for loop and everything is just smashed together and you want a space in there and you can add spaces simply just by doing this. So what I'm showing you right now, you may be thinking this is not ever going to be helpful and it I wouldn't be showing it to you if this wasn't helpful and it's something you're going to run into in the future. So this is a very streamlined course and I'm showing you just what you need to know in the world of cybersecurity. Now we're going to be covering something called a variable and a variable holds the place of some kind of data that we're going to want to use later. So we'll go ahead and comment this out and on a Mac it is command and then question mark. And so we'll comment that out. So now if we run our program, there's no output. And we're going to look at a variable. So a variable can be something like this name and then the name Jim. This name is going to hold whatever is right here. So this is our variable, which is going to represent the name Jim. So if we come down here and we print and then we type in name and then we run this it's going to print what is stored inside this variable. When we look at variables, one of the things you're going to want to be able to do, especially in the world of cybersecurity, if you ever want to write your own tool is you're going to be saving variables, only they're going to be input variables. So if we were to go like this and we say name equals input, and then we type, what is your name? And then we'll want a space right here. So when we type in the prompt, it has a space. We'll comment this out. And then we'll print name. So we're going to print the variable, whatever the user inputs here. So now we can say, what is your name? And we can say Tom. And when we hit enter, it prints Tom. And there's something else that's really cool that I use all the time. It's called an F string. And what you do is you add an F at the beginning of your string, but you can print variables inside your string. So we'll go ahead and put name inside here. And so we can say hello and then the name. So we'll say run this. What is your name? Tim. And it puts out hello Tim. So this is an F string. This is something you're going to want to know. This is something I use all the time. And in the next coming up videos, we're going to look at data types and how we can pull information out of a specific string. And this comes becomes really useful whenever you run a script on a victim machine or on your target machine or your target server. 
you you may get a, a lot of output that you don't really need and this is a good way to start extracting data so we'll start that here in just a moment okay it is time to draw out some information from our string so what we can do here is we can save a variable and we'll call this variable name and we can put inside of our name Tommy so we have Tommy here and let's say we want to grab just this M right here what we can do with this is we can say print we want to print our name and then we add some square brackets just like this and when you're running Python it always starts at zero so it goes zero one two and so that first M is going to be two just like this and so if we run this it's going to print that M for us and just to show you if we want to print the T we would enter a zero here and this is one of the most basic ways to draw out information and it's going to get a lot more complex as we go but this is what the square brackets do when you see them and when we start to tackle lists and arrays these square brackets become a really useful tool to remember so as we continue to go through this I want to pause right here and I want you to go ahead and play around in your own text editor and print some make some print statements, make them on new lines, add in some spaces, make some inputs and actually practice gathering information and maybe have two or three inputs and have it print things back and forth and you have a little conversation with your text editor. So I want to go ahead and give you this challenge for you to go ahead and play around with the things you've learned so far and try and really ingrain this information into your mind. These are the foundations of Python programming and you need to know and understand how they work. You're gonna notice is you can name variables whatever you want and I name my variables really poorly mostly because the programs I write I write for myself and I am not working with a team of developers but maybe you will someday and when you name your variables you can name them whatever you want and you will wanna make them names so other people can understand what is going on so if you look at some of the code I've written in past videos I do this right here I name everything like this and it is not really the best way to go about naming these so I'll name one guy one and I'll go guy two and he'll equal Bob and then I'll come down here and I'll print uh, guy two and then I run this and then I have Tim and Bob you can you can name variables whatever you want literally you can go whatever I want and you can make this a variable and then you can come down here and you can print whatever you want right there and you can name variables whatever you want so I would recommend getting in a good habit of making your variables something that you can recognize and it's a very bad habit that I have because I make my variables so that people cannot read what I have done so this is something I'm trying to get better at, but I probably won't because this is a bad habit that has formed over many years. But I want you to have a good habit of naming your variables something that you can understand and other people can understand. So as you go through and work through your challenge, try to name your variables different things that you will be able to understand in six months after you have written a program and you need to go back and edit it. Okay, I have created this little challenge here for you. If you want, you can go ahead and pause the video and open up your text editor and see if you can create this little program right here. So we want to, one, create an input with a greeting. So just say, hello, what is your favorite food? Let them put it in and then take another input and say, what is your favorite hobby? and store that also in a variable and then we're going to print with an f string their favorite food and their hobby so if you want to give this a go you can go ahead and give it a try if not we will start it now so we're going to start out with create an input with a greeting so we'll just say print hello and then we're going to take an input but we got to save it as a variable so we'll save this as food 
and it's going to equal an input and in, we're inside the input we're going to have the question what is your favorite food question mark space I see that we have a typo here on all three and then that's going to be saved as their food then we're going to say input and this is going to be we'll just save this as hobby and we're going to take in input and we're going to say what is your favorite hobby question mark space and then we're going to print with an f string all of this together and we'll say print your favorite food is and then if you remember we need our f string here and we should grab our curly braces and say food and your favorite hobby is curly braces hobby now when we run this if we did everything right it should print for us this final statement after we give these inputs so we say run and it says hello what is your favorite food and we'll just say chips what is your favorite hobby running and it says your favorite food is chips and your favorite hobby is running so this is a simple input form and it's going to print out with our variables that we have stored and this is a good practice because when you write a program for a tool maybe that you develop in the future you are going to want to know how to do inputs so that way you can take the input save it in a variable and then later do something with it so later on in the course i'm going to give you a practical example of taking input and then running it in a program that is really helpful and i will cover that when we are ready for it all right, so we have covered the string so far. This integer is a whole number. So if we say int, we have a number of seven. Floats, we're not really gonna use these a whole lot in the world of cybersecurity. They have a point within the number. So 3.14 would be an example of a float to date. I cannot remember a single time I have used a float in cybersecurity. Usually that's more towards data science or something of that nature. A, a boolean is true false you will want to remember boolean we'll cover these a bit in the future when we do our while loops we'll be using the true false so these are some of the different data types and just to get an idea of what these look like if we save a variable and we make it a float and we say like one two three and then we print this it will tell us what we have so we can come down here and we can say print and then we can put type and then we can put in our variable and when we run this it will tell us that we have a float and if we put in an integer it will tell us that we have an integer and then so on and so forth we can do this with an int, and then we can also do this with a string and we can hit run and it tells us we have a string sometimes we will do something like this and then we have this saved as a string here and then when we go to add this to something else we can get an error and it's because we have a string and we'll be trying to add together a string and a integer and it won't work so we'll go variable two equals three and then when we say variable three equals variable one plus variable two we're going to get an error and it's going to tell us that you can you can't add these together so this is one version of how these matter another version of this is let's say we want to print and we say we have an integer right here and we want to add it to a string and we can go like this and we say 70 what do you think is going to happen it tells us we can't add these together but if we take this and we turn this into an integer what will happen now 
now it works. So this is the difference. So this is an integer. This is a string unless we declare it to be an integer. And you can do the same thing with floats. So I'm not going to cover those. And then what happens if we do this right here? What do you think the output will be? And the answer is 70, 70. So this is the difference between integers and strings and how they work with numbers and data. So if we wanted to, we can turn both of these into integers. And this is the last example, I promise. I don't want to bore you with adding these together. And then we say enter and we're back to 140. So this is a little bit of strings, integers, and booleans. And we'll kind of skip floats because I don't think we'll really need them, but it's worth mentioning so you know they're here. And with that, we will continue on with our next challenge. Okay, so we have these numbers here, number one, two, three, four, five, saved as num1, and then num2, and then num3. What I want you to do is to write this to your console, or write this to your text editor, and then I want you to add this variable plus this variable and see what the output is. And then I want you to take the second number in num1, so it would be this 2 right here, and I want you to add it to the second number in num3, which is this 7. So your output should be 9. I want to see if you can figure that out. And then the third challenge is to take num2 uh, and change, it, change num2 into a float and print the type to the console so that way the console tells us that it is a float so if you'd like to go ahead and pause and give this a try you can do that now or we will go ahead and tackle this right now together so what we are going to do just first is we're just going to print and we're going to say we're going to turn this into an integer and we're going to go and write in num1 and then we'll add this as an integer and then we will say num2 and this needs to be closed off or we are we will get an error and this should print it for us so it tells us here is the total if we add those together and then the second challenge is to add the second number so we'll just take this just a heads up copy and paste and programming is always a bad idea because if I have a bug here I just now copied and pasted it and I have two of them but what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to put in our square brackets. And if you remember, it says zero, 01. So we're going to say 1. And then we're going to say 1. I guess I didn't really need this. And then we'll print this. And our output is 9. So now we've grabbed the second numbers. And then our third challenge is to change number two into a float so that it prints float. So what we want to do here is just say print and then we're going to tell it we want a type and we want to print out the type of num2 and then above that we're going to just type in num2. You can do this two different ways. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to say num2 equals num2 and we'll just go like this and we'll type float and we'll close this off and now if we print this it tells us it is a float and we will continue on with our python course in the next section okay we are going to do a walkthrough of if elif and else statements. So this is the instructions for the, the little program I'm going to write. But when I finish this program, I'm going to give you a challenge to do something similar on your own. So I'm only going to give one example you're, and you're going to need to pay attention and maybe watch this walkthrough twice and then go on and try the challenge. So the first thing we're going to do is if you are under five, you are a kid. So our if statement is going to first need an input from the user that is going to tell us what is their age. So we'll just say we have a variable and we want it to be an integer An integer and we want an input and we're going to ask them what is your age question mark space and we have to have that space otherwise it's really ugly in the terminal 
and then we're going to start our if statement. So we're going to say if a you, this person's, their input, which is their variable, is less than the age of five, then we want it to print that they are a kid. So we'll print you are a kid. Now, one thing we want to do is if they hit the age of five, we'll need an equal sign here. Otherwise, I'll just show you. If we say we'll need an else statement so this doesn't error out. Actually, we'll just let it error out. We'll say, what is your age? And they say five. And we get no output because they this doesn't include five. Remembering that the computer starts at zero and then it's going to stop at four. So if we want to include five in as yours a kid, we'll need that the variable is less than or equal to a five. Now, if we put the five in here, it will print for us. You are a kid. So what we, we need to do next is we're going to type in elif because we're going to make an elif statement and we're going to say the variable is less than 15. And the reason we don't have to worry about anything under five is because it will catch this if statement and then this whole program we write after this will stop and the computer will actually skip it. So we don't need to worry about adding anything else in here. And we can say, actually, if you are less than or equal to 15, then we are going to print, you are a big kid. And then for the final elif, elif, we will say the variable, and we will say if it is greater than or equal to 21, and that's ugly, and we will say print, and we're going to print you are a bigger kid. And now we're going to put in an else statement, and in our else statement we're going to print uh, anything that's over 21, we're just going to print you are old. So now if we run this, and we rerun the program, we run it and we say, how old are you? And we say three, we get your kid. If we say 13, we get your big kid. If we say 18, we see you're a bigger kid. And if we say you are 44, we get you are old. Now, because we're going to be using this as a tool for us to be able to write tools and modify tools, I'm not going to cover this because I think that it's not really necessary for cybersecurity. But if somebody were to run this and they put in the letter A, the letter A it's going to crash our program because the letter A or the, is not a number. It's not an integer. So what we'd have to do is we would have to make this so that if they, if they put this in and it was an A, it would print, enter a number and then rerun. But we're not going to do that because it's not really necessary for cybersecurity. It's just something to be aware about. Now, what's coming up is your challenge. Let me delete all this and I will write up your challenge for you in the next section. Your challenge here is to take the temperature from the user and then tell them if it is less than 20 degrees, you need boots. And this is from the US, so I'm running in Fahrenheit, not Celsius. And if it's less than 30, you will need a coat. If it's less than 70, you will need a jacket. If it's over 70, it is nice outside. So take this input or take this information and make a program with if, elif, and else statements. Okay. So here is how I would go about doing this. I would take an input and it will say, what is the temp outside? And this, is, this will need to be an integer because we're gonna be comparing this as a number. So we'll say if var, is less than 20 then we're going to print you need boots 
and we'll say elif var is less than 30 print you need a coat and then we're going to use one more elif here elif var is less than 70 print you need a jacket and then finally we'll do else and it's above 70 then it's nice out and we don't actually need to put anything in there because this is an else statement so everything that's above 70 will automatically print it is nice outside so when we run this if we put 12 we need boots if it's 22 we need a coat and if it is 65 we need a jacket and if it's 85 in my opinion it's perfect outside so this is the if and the elif and the else statements we're going to be moving into for loops and later we're going to look at nested if statements and they'll look something like this if it's less than 20 and then we can say if it is if var is less than we'll say it's actually it's greater than 25 then we can print you need boots and then we'll print something like gloves so nested if statements look something like this and you can have nested if statements just so you're aware of it so if we say it's 26 it it will oh because we're hitting this one we'll hit we'll say this is 15 so if we say that the temperature is 16 we hit you need gloves and you will need boots so this is a nested if statement uh, we'll cover these a little more in the future I don't know how much you will need these nested if statements I use them every now and then so it's nice to know that you can run nested if statements but for now we're going to move on to our for loops before we get into for loops too far I want to show you why for loops are important and I also want to show you why lists are important which we're going to be going over here in just a minute after we get the basic understanding of a for loop so this is a program I've shown it before it don't worry about what it looks like it looks kind of complicated but it's really not what happens is you put in a repo that you would like to target on github to go and search for all of the usernames passwords and files that just shouldn't be made to the public so in this case it's looking for pass for passwords on github but what we have done here is a for loop so this for loop right here we have an empty list which we're going to cover in a second and it goes out to github right here and it will go through all these links everything you can click on and it's going to narrow it all the way down to the repositories and it will click this link and then it will click to it'll click the file and then it will click the raw then it copies this entire thing and it puts it into a text it puts it into a csv file and then checks for the word password so that's the program itself but what's important to remember is what happens is it goes out and it pulls all the links and puts them in a list then it goes through this for loop and it puts takes all of these and it says for every one of these items that is inside of the links which is actually this variable that I have up top it's going to do something so for loops are very important you can see I have another one right here so for loops we are going to need them lists you are going to need them as well and 
I just wanted to show you this because sometimes what happens is you'll be going through trying to learn something and I'm showing you something very elementary and you are like, why, why do I need to know a program that tells me to put on a jacket? This is all building up to something that is going to be able to help you build tools and more specifically, if you're new, just be able to read through exploits and be able to edit them because you're going to need to know how to read Python and edit exploits as you grow in the world of cybersecurity. So here is a very basic for loop. And I'm going to show you it in a string because we've already covered strings. And what this all this does is we have our variable string right here that is holding hello world. And so the way the for loop works is it says for i in string. So this i right here is going to be another variable that holds one letter each time the for loop runs this I is going to represent one letter and in a list it's going to represent each item in the list so this will run I'm gonna run it so you can see what this looks like the way it runs is it goes for I in string so it's gonna grab the first letter which is going to be the H and then it prints it but the for loop is not over so it runs the loop again and it'll grab the E and it'll print just the E on a new line and then it goes through and it runs every single time until it is out of things to run and then it closes the loop. So this is how for loops work. I'd like for you to go ahead and write out your own for loop and maybe put something different in here and try to get an understanding of how it works. And if we wanted this to print all of this together, you would have to store this into a new variable and then print it outside the for loop down here like this. And this is where we would print our new variable. And we're going to cover this in lists because this is something that you will need to do in the future. So go ahead, play around with the for loop, write one, get an understanding of how it works. If this doesn't make sense, rewatch it and hopefully it makes sense. I know after teaching for loops to several different students that for loops sometimes can be hard to understand, but they are really useful and something you need to learn. So we're gonna be covering lists in the next section. We're going to be looking at lists and a list is something that is gonna be useful because we're going to be appending to lists all the time within our for loops. So a list can look like this. My list equals square bracket and lists always go inside of square brackets and we can say item one and then comma item two and then we can do an item three. So we have our list here, and if we want to run a for loop through this list, we will say for i in my list print i. And now if we run this, it will run item one, item two, item three. So this is a list, we will be using these in the coming lessons and they will be helpful for you in the future as you've seen in this program i have two lists right here and they are used regularly to append to so lists is something you will need to know so go ahead make your own list and see if you can loop through your list and maybe try and just print something like this later just print the item two, so you'll have item one, two, three, and then print number two, and see if you can remember how to do that. If you have forgotten, it would look something like this. Print, and then we can say my list, and then we can put this in square brackets, and we'd say zero, one, and then we have a one, and now we could print this, and we have one, two, three, two. So that is, going to be it for the lists. We're going to move on and we're going to start using lists in a more comprehensive manner. 
So we're going to try a while loop now. And the way we're gonna do a while loop is by using a Boolean. I like to set a variable and then set it to true. And then at the end of the while loop, I will set it to false. So the way this works is make a variable and we'll just say variable, actually we'll name it on. That's a good way to name the variable and we'll say on equals true. And then we'll say while on and we'll make a variable and we'll just call it variable because I don't know what to name it. And we will take an input and we will say continue running while loop. And then we will put y, we'll, we'll put a y or a no. So do, would you like the while loop to continue? Yes or no. And then we can say that we can go do something like this and then we can set a variable up here and say i equals zero just so you can see how many times this is running and then we'll say i plus equals one and then this should just continue to run and then we'll put an if statement say if the variable equals equals in then we'll say that on equals false and this will kill our for loop so now if we run this it'll say would you continue continue running the while loop and we will say yes 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 and then when we say no it'll kill the while loop i forgot to print I forgot to print our I so that we could see this. So now we can say, would you like to continue? Yes, yes. And you can see our variable every time the, I, the for loop runs, our I gets added to one. So our for loop has run. Now it says seven times, eight times, nine, 10. And then when we're done, we can say no and we can end it. We are going to be starting functions and just to be clear, I have not pre-written any of the code we're about to go over or mostly anything we've gone through in this course. That's why you've seen me make mistakes. And so as we start functions, I'm going to try and make this a little more realistic for us so that when we are thinking through functions and writing code in the realm of cyber in the realm of cybersecurity, you can start to get an idea of how this can be used. So we're going to start with functions and a function just calls something very specific that we want to happen. So we can just say, we'll call it my function. And then the way your function is going to start is with a def my function. And then we close it off like this. And then down here, we want our function to do something very specific. So we can say print, and then we can say it worked. And the way a function gets called is usually somewhere further down inside the code, something happens and it triggers this function back up above it for it to actually do something. So what would happen in order to call this is we would just say my function. Now when we run this, when the computer reaches this right here, this closing bra bracket right here, I usually like to think of this as the call sign for the function. So if we run this, it's gonna print it worked. And this will become more clear as we write more of these. But this is the basic concept of functions. And one thing we can do with functions is we can pass through variables. So we can say something along the lines of I, and then we can say I, or we'll, we'll make it a different variable. We'll say variable equals I plus three. And then we can say print, and then we can say we want to print our variable. And so in our function, we can pass information through like this. So when we say my function, we can now say input, and then we can say, what would you like to add? And because this is a string, we're gonna to need to make this into an integer. 
I guess we can go and make it an integer right here and we can say int and then we can close this off. Now when we run this, it's going to ask us what would we like to add and we can say three enter and it'll say three plus three equals six. So this is a very basic function. So we take some kind of input right here. This is where we call our function. So now this function is being triggered, but we want to pass something into our function, some kind of variable or some kind of information that we've grabbed somewhere else. And what happens is it can now use this inside the function. This, you may be thinking like in what case would I possibly ever need to use this? And so I'm gonna just show you my GitHub dumpster diving tool, once again, that I've used multiple times on this channel. This right here, where it's grabbed a repo, I call this function and it's gonna loop through to see every single file inside of the repo. Is it a Python file? Is it a JavaScript file? Is it an XML file? And what happens is when I pass this repo through it now is able to use this variable that has come from somewhere else inside this function and then I do the same thing up here I pass through a variable inside of a function so this is really important to know and you will use it and we're gonna go ahead and give another example and actually before we give another example I want you to try and write your own function and see if you can get it to take an input. So let's take the input and make it the first letter of your name. So I'll write out the instructions. You want the, we'll say first letter of your name and you want to take this as an input. So we'll say input and then you want to call a function that adds your first letter to the rest of your name. So here's your instructions. You're going to make a function and then you're, it's going to take a variable and that variable is going to be the first letter of your name and then you're going to add that to the rest of your name. So I hope this makes sense and I'll go ahead and walk you through what this would look like. So we'll go def my function and then we are going to call this function we're going to pass through let's use i as our variable so that stops giving us whenever this is giving us an error and i can't stand looking at it i type in pass and that will not give us the error and we'll come back and delete that in a second and we're going to call my function and we're going to take another input and we're going to say what is the first letter of your name question mark now we can delete this and we're going to come back up here and we're going to use this and we're going to say that my function and we're going to take this input and it's going to be a pass through as I and so down here we're just going to say my first name is Ryan so we will say I we'll call it the variable equals i plus and then we can put the rest of this inside of a string and we can say something like this and then we can print our variable so when we run this if i put an r in here it'll print out my name so i hope you're able to figure this out maybe try to come up with another way to write a function and practice writing functions and see if you can get the hang of it and in the next section, I'm, we're going to go over something that will show you how this can be really helpful in building your own tool. Okay, I hope you have played around with functions and you are now ready to try and become a little more advanced. And we're going to try and gear it towards cybersecurity now. And I hope you're familiar with maybe the InMap scan and some other tools. So we'll just use an InMap scan right now. And we'll just say, like, we're going to call a function and we'll call it in map. And this is going to take a variable and we'll actually call it the IP because we're going to take an IP address. And the way I like to run my in map scans is with the, they'll look something like this in map dash A 
like this and then we're going to pass in the IP address and then I like it to be verbose. Now in order to get this to run we would have to import a module called OS but we're not ready for that so this is just to show you how the functions will work and so I will wrap this entire thing inside of curly braces um, I got dashes in here that shouldn't be there. I don't know why I did that. And then we'll wrap this inside curly braces. This is not supposed to be inside curly braces. That is supposed to be inside of quotes. And we'll make this an F string and we'll say our variable equals. Instead, this would be an OS command if we were actually going to run this in our Linux machine or Windows, whatever you choose to use as your hacking VM. And now what we do is we'd come down here and we would say um, something like inmap to call our function. And then we're going to take an input and we're going to say what IP would you like to scan. And then right here we are going to print running in map scan against and then we will put in the IP address and this will need to be an F string so the way this or w sorry that will not be the IP that will be against the variable so it will tell us that it is running the in map scan right here okay so when we run this we can say what's wh who would we like to scan against and we'd say 192.168 point something point something else and then we run this it'll print running in map scan against and then it gives us the output right here so this would be a way that if you were trying to write your own tool to automate your recon this would be one of those ways you would use a function in order to automate your recon and there's a lot more you can do with this IP address and you could pass it into multiple different tools and then you have written your own tool. So this is how we can use functions in cybersecurity that are really helpful for us and whenever you're going for a certification it'll be really helpful for you to be able to read through functions and maybe modify them especially in exploits because uh, vulnerabilities and exploits change over time and you will need to be able to change and modify different ex different exploits that you come across on Google in order to gain access to a machine. Before we end this course, I want to give you a little bit of an introduction into making your own tools and then I want to challenge you to add to this recon tool that I'm about to show you and you can start to build your own tool for recon and it'll help you remember the python code that we've gone over so far in this course so i've gone ahead and connected to hack the box and launched the box devel and so i want to just show you what os system does so we'll import os system you've seen this before and this is just our operating system it just means we're going to be able to tell our linux machine to carry out commands the exact same way you would inside of a terminal so we're going to make a function and we're going to call it recon and we're going to pass through an IP address really if you remember this is just a variable that we're going to be passing through into the function and then we're going to call our function down here and we'll just call it recon and then we're going to ask for an input and then we're going to say what IP would you like to scan and then we'll put a question mark and a space there so that way it's not all smashed together and now inside of here what we can do to make this program run our recon and automate it for us is we can type OS system and then we can put in here we're gonna make this an F string what we want to do so we're gonna run an in map scan and we're gonna run it on all port or we're gonna want all outputs we're gonna run it on all ports and just in case it is blocking the ping we'll put the P in you don't have to put this in here it's optional and then we are going to put in the IP address that we run through and I really like to run everything as verbose 
So this, when we run this, you'll be able to see, it'll say, what IP would you like to scan? And I'll put in the IP address, and it will now start the scan for us. So this is the same thing we would see inside the terminal. We're gonna see port 80, port 21 is open, and at the end of the scan, it will tell us everything that has happened on this scan. Now you can add to this, we'll stop this, you can add to this same scan when it gets done running the in-map scan, you can come down here and maybe you want to look for different directories. And so you could go os.system and we're going to make an F string and we can add in, maybe we want it to run derb and we want it to run on the same IP address that we've already passed in and it will now launch this right here as soon as it gets done with in-map. And the cool thing about this is if you have your own recon tool set up, you can go ahead and run the program, send over the IP address, and then you can leave and it will automatically run your recon or maybe while your recon tool is running, you can do other more manual enumeration. Maybe it has port 80 open and you see that real quick with the in-map scan and you want to start looking at what's on port 80 and it will run your in-map scan, it will run your Durbuster for you and maybe you wanna run WFuzz or maybe you want to run Sublister. I want you to go ahead and start off with what I have given you right here and you can add to this tool with the information that you have learned so far. Okay, so in this video we're going to be covering enumerating APIs or backend APIs and I see this in bug bounty programs sometimes and I'm sure you guys have come across a page that looks exactly like this. You come in, you go to the URL and you get some JSON in return and I actually was looking through a bug bounty program just a few days ago and I actually saw it said backend and then api.theprogram.com and so uh, if you're new and you're not really sure how to enumerate APIs, then this video is going to be for you. We're gonna keep it really short and specific so the way you can go out and do this yourself. Um, we're gonna be looking at the box backend on Hack the Box, but we're not actually going to walk through the box. I just wanna show you how to enumerate APIs because this is something that isn't covered in any courses or any certifications that I know of. So. If you come in to your terminal and you have an API like this and you come in here and you type in like V1 or you're typing in basically anything, you're just trying to figure out how do you get further down the line, you're just looking for endpoints. The tool I like to use for API fuzzing is Fuff. So it looks just like this. If I can get here, Fuff, there we go. And I actually ran this just to make sure it was gonna work before I did the video. So I like to run fuff and then you give it the URL and this is the API and then we're gonna be fuzzing for an endpoint and then you give it a word list that you wanna use. Uh, GoBuster and Derb and a lot of those, uh, your usual fuzzing tools just don't work with API. So I like fuff because it does work. And you run this and you see it pulls down docs and API. So if you were to do this like in a live program, you'd come in here and you just type in API and then it says we have V1. So you can just type in V1 and then you'll have user and you can kind of see if we wanted to look for more endpoints, we could just close out of this and we would just move our fuzzer over. So you would just go like this and then it would fuzz right here and it would look for more endpoints over on this point. So that's how this fuzzing APIs work. If you're interested, you can go ahead and do the box, hack the box. It's actually really simple. Uh, you just create a username using the API. So you'll use burp, you'll just intercept the request and it'll send you back a JSON of what you need. And then you can make turn your request into a post request and make a username and password and log in. So this is API fuzzing. You'll see these on bug bounty programs and sometimes you'll come across them in hack the box machines, but this is something that's not really covered. So I wanted to make a quick video on API fuzzing and uh, bug bounty. So sometimes you can find an API, an API URL like this, and you can just start fuzzing away and see what information you can come back with and manipulating the request. So 
That is API fuzzing. 